Good afternoon and welcome to today's City Council meeting. Madam City Clerk, could you please call the roll? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been informed that Council Member Tibbetts will not be at today's Council meeting, so he will be marked absent. Uh, Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Fleming? Council Member Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor Rogers? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Council Member Fleming, have you joined us? There's Council Member Fleming. Excellent. So let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Council Member Tibbetts. Okay, we'll start our day in closed session with item 2.1. If you have any comments to give on this item, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. And Madam De Deputy City Clerk, can you please handle public comment? Thank you, Mayor. If you wish to make a public comment on the closed session item today, please do so in Zoom with the raise hand feature. If participating via telephone, please dial star nine. Mayor, there are no hands being raised in Zoom. There are no members of the public wishing to speak in person and we receive no voice message public comments on this item. Okay, we'll go ahead and recess into closed session then.
those of you just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish in translation. Paloma, can you please restate this in Spanish? Para aquellos que acaban de conectarse a esta junta, por favor, va a haber una traducción en vivo en español disponible a cualquier miembro que desee escucharlo en español. Para hacer esto, por favor, oprima el icon de Zoom abajo en su barra y va a haber un globo mundial donde puede escoger el idioma español o el canal de español. Le recomendamos que apague su audio principal y para poder escuchar la traducción en español. Go ahead. Thank you, Paloma. I'll be putting you over into the Spanish channel to interpret with Pablo. Thank you for your help today. Gracias. Pablo, can we do one last mic check from the Spanish channel, please? Thank you.
Welcome back. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, as I announced earlier, Council Member Tibbetts will not be attending the meeting today. So we'll start with Council Member Schwedhelm. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Council Member Fleming. Here. Council Member Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor Rogers. Present. Mayor Rogers. Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Tibbetts. Great, Mr. City Manager, let's go on to item 3.1. Mayor Rogers is members of the city council. Item 3.1 is our first of two study session items this afternoon. The matter before the council is the homeless services request for proposals for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Kelly Kuykendall, our Homeless Services Manager, is going to be providing the staff report on this item. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers and members of the Council. Next slide, please. So as the City Manager um, introduced the item, I will be presenting a study session to review a draft of Homeless Services Request for Proposals. I'll refer to it as an RFP um, and seeking council direction to issue this RFP. Uh, I had initially scheduled it for this Friday. With the holiday, I realize that's a little ambitious. So uh, subject to your feedback this afternoon, uh, we'll plan to get that out on Monday, November 15th. My presentation this afternoon will be brief. Um, looking for council direction on the draft RFP and then also looking forward to hearing from the public about the RFP. Next slide, please. The purpose of the RFP is to seek proposals from qualified and experienced organizations to provide homeless services and for operation of the city-owned Samuel Jones Hall um, shelter. I'll refer to that as Sam Jones Hall throughout the presentation for the upcoming fiscal year, uh, 2022 and 2023. Next slide, please. The purpose for the RFP, um, the second purpose slide here, is the city uh, has significantly increased in its investment in homeless services over the past several years. Uh, the council is aware of that. Obviously, this is a top priority for the city council to provide you with some context. Going back to fiscal year 2015-2016, our budget for homeless services programs was $1.5 million. In the current fiscal year, 2021-2022, uh, that's almost five million. Um, I was double checking the numbers this afternoon before the study council or before the study session, and the budget is uh, 4.9 million dollars for our homeless services program for the current fiscal year. So, with that, with an increased uh, focus on um, addressing homelessness in the community as well as increased investment, we're shifting um, the sort of annual allocation of our funding to a competitive process. The last time the city's run a competitive process was in 2004 when Catholic Charities was selected, selected as the operator for Sam Jones Hall and, and that shelter opened in 2005. We do run an annual process through our public services program through the Housing and Community Services Department for Community Development Block Grant funding. And that goes to the Homeless Service Center and Family Support Center operated by Catholic Charities as well as the living room. Next slide, please. The term of the RFP, um, we're of course looking for providers with capacity to implement the program by July of 2022. The initial term will be for fiscal year 22-23 and up to five years. Um, so through 22, 23, up to fiscal year 2026 and 2027. This is of course on a conditional basis. So uh, annual uh, renewals will be subject to uh, available funding as well as contractor performance. Next slide. So in terms of the scope, there are two uh, key areas in the scope. Uh, one is homeless services and I'll cover that in this slide, the second is uh, the operator for Sam Jones Hall. So the city currently provides funding in five key areas for homeless services. Those are outlined in this slide. So we have day services, 
street outreach and encampment resolution, emergency shelter, housing support, and community-based solutions through our community homeless assistance program. And our current providers that we fund are Catholic Charities, Community Action Partnership of Sonoma County, the YWCA, and the Living Room. And then through CHAP, we're also working with the faith-based community. That last bullet there, other innovative approaches. So as part of this RFP, we are open to considering other ideas, other approaches to uh, addressing um, homelessness in Santa Rosa um, within the scope of the five, five key areas that I just outlined. Um, of course, any uh, you know, new programs um, would be subject to available funding and those providers or those proposals would have to meet the criteria outlined in the RFP, including fidelity to housing first. Next slide, please. The second category under the RFP scope includes uh, operator, selecting an operator for Sam Jones Hall. Um, some of the criteria for, for that um, program or that facility is that the provider must operate the shelter in a low barrier model. Uh, we wanna serve uh, the most vulnerable in need of shelter and work with them to get them into shelter and services, not to screen them out. So that's the, that's the approach with low barrier. Low barrier, I also mentioned housing foes, fo focused, that it's housing focused, that in addition to providing shelter and basic um, services that we wanna make sure we're um, providing the support that people need to uh, move out of homelessness and into housing. Uh, already touched on basic services and case management. And then that the proposer or the applicant would have experience operating a shelter of similar size and scope. Next slide. So general requirements, these are of course outlined in greater detail in the RFP, which is uh, part of the agenda packet. Uh, applicants or proposers must um, have nonprofit status. They must have experience providing similar services. Uh, I already mentioned fidelity to housing first. Also alignment with our, our local continuum of care. That includes um, data and reporting through the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS, uh, participation, partic participation in coordinated entry, and for those operating emergency shelter, compliance with the COC emergency shelter standards. We also wanna see that providers have uh, policies and procedures for uh, engaging the client, clients they serve and the broader community, as well as seeking um, the feedback from clients and the community. Uh, partnership is a key component of the RFP. Our Providers are partners in responding to homelessness in the community. And so we need to see in their response, um, in their proposal, um, and in their um, prior experience and ability to partner, partner with the city and all the various stakeholders that we're working with on this issue. Reporting is also imp important. So uh, providers need to demonstrate a track record of um, meeting reporting requirements, uh, whether that's through the city or with other agencies that they've worked with. Next slide. Thank you. A proposed schedule for the RFP, as I mentioned, we'll be releasing this on Monday, November 15th. We'll be holding a uh, conference for interested applicants or proposers on the 19th to um, answer any questions that they might have the RFP will be due on December 13th. Uh, we'll be convening an evaluation committee to review the proposals in December. Um, we've discussed uh, who to include on that evaluation committee with the uh, housing and homeless ad hoc committee members, uh, Vice Mayor Rogers and Council Member Schwethelm. And tentatively, if we can meet all these benchmarks, uh, we'll be returning to city council in January on the 25th to make recommendations to city council um, for the uh, operator of Sam Jones Hall and providers of our homeless services program for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, this will uh, give us the time to draft the contracts, um, work with any new providers, uh, bring those back to uh, council um, 
uh, just about the same time that you're going to be adopting the uh, adopting the budget and then the contracts would start on July 1st. Next slide, please. In terms of criteria, again, um, this is just a summary slide of the criteria that the evaluation committee will be using to, of course, evaluate and rank and score um, any proposals that we get. The criteria is um, described in greater detail in the RFP, and that's on page 11 of the RFP in the agenda packet. I'll walk through each of these just to give you some more detail about them. And can you one sec here? So for organizational capacity, sorry, I'm having a technical issue there. There we go. We're looking for uh, agencies that demonstrate uh, both the infrastructure and experience to deliver the services described in this RFP. For best practices um, that the applicants demonstrate experience providing responsive services in alignment with Housing First, as I mentioned, and other best practices with an emphasis on a proven ab ability to get clients housed. Uh, financial reasonability, so we're looking at um, the budget um, to see if there's a thorough allocation of resources, uh, that the budget is clear and thorough and provides justification for all line items. For wraparound services, we want to see that they have a proven delivery of, of providing these services, either directly or through a subcontractor. And for data and reporting, um, we want to see that they have a proven track record of meeting um, data and reporting um, requirements, either with the city or other agencies, such as the county or the continuum of care. And that would also include, um, you know, in addition to local and continuum of care reporting, also to other agencies, other entities, such as the federal government and the state. And strategic goals. So we want to see in their response alignment with city council priorities and the COC strategic goals, um, including diversity, equity, and inclusion. Another priority of the city. Uh, another priority of the city council. And then client engagement and feedback. Um, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, but we want to see that there's policies and procedures in place for engaging clients and seeking feedback, um, and that includes the community. And the other category includes, you know, completeness and quality of proposal, quality of references or supplemental materials, and any other factors that, um, you know, staff or the evaluation committee might deem relevant to the scope of the RFP. Lastly, we have um, some bonus points here. Uh, that's 10 bonus points for a new provider or innovative program. Um, so, you know, a provider or program that the city is not currently working with. And the, the reason for the bonus points, just to touch on that briefly, we really want to be able to provide options. We want to encourage innovation, and we don't want to exclude or discourage new providers. Um, we're also open to existing providers, so that bonus points could go to existing providers if they have uh, a new approach, an innovative approach to delivering the service that we're not currently providing. Um, for new agencies, I do just want to highlight, we're going to be looking for, um, you know, a new agency that we haven't worked with, that we don't have a track record with. We want to see documentation of their experience providing similar services with, uh, you know, other agencies. Um, and that, you know, uh, sorry, just looking at my notes here. Um, they would still be held to, you know, all the requirements of uh, the, the RFP. Um, and again, we're just going to be looking to, if they haven't worked with us directly, that they do have experience um, delivering similar services as those outlined in the RFP um, and with other um, government agencies. Before we go to the next slide, and that's the recommendation side, so I'm just about to wrap it up here. I did want to touch briefly on outreach or what outreach we're doing related to this RFP. So an announcement went out last week uh, via City Connections to let the community know that the uh, draft RFP would be before you this afternoon. Uh, I did send it out to the um, continuum of care listserv so all of our providers countywide are aware that the City of Santa Rosa is going to be releasing an RFP. Uh, we've reached out to our current providers and we're also going to be reaching out to providers out of the area that other um, communities in Sonoma County have expressed interest in working with. Next slide. 
fit that, we have a recommendation slide. Um, it is recommended by the city manager's office that the count council hold a study session to review a draft of the homeless services RFP for fiscal year 2022-2023 and provide direction on the RFP prior to its issuance tentatively scheduled for November 15th, 2021. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. Councilor, are there questions? Council Member Alvarez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Kelly, in, in the historically, who have, who have been the providers for services for the city of Santa Rosa? Thank you, Council Member Alvarez, for that question. So we currently fund programs that are operated by the following providers, Catholic Charities, Community Action Partnership of Sonoma County, the YWCA, the, and the living room, and then through our CHAP program, which is pretty small, we're working with the faith-based community. We do provide some grants to assist them with things like um, trash service and portable toilets and hand washing stations. Thank you, Phil. Council Member Swedom. Okay, thank you for that presentation. I know what a challenge this is since it was last done in 2004, and I don't think there's many folks who've been around to see how we did it back then. Um, some of this, uh, I apologize because we had at our subcommittee meeting, I brought this up, but I just want to hear the thoughts of the rest of the council. Um, regarding innovative programs, um, that term, how, how would we evaluate what's an innovative program? And I'm, I'll preface it by saying uh, another county program, Upstream Investments, they have a category for investments called Promising Practices, and there's four different areas where here's how you're going to say this is a promising practice. I'm a little unclear as how the panel, whoever, whoever will be, if someone is saying I have an innovative program, how are we going to evaluate that? Because what's innovation for one person, but if there's no evidence or promising practices, how would we do that? Do you have a vision on that? Thank you for that question, Councilmember Schwedhelm. Um, we're going to be thinking through exactly what that means and defining it further before the evaluation committee convenes. And so I appreciate um, the suggestion about the county's upstream investments. We can look at that and I'm open to, you know, other feedback from the council on how we should, you know, be defining that and how we should be evaluating it. Great. So, yeah, so I, I'd be strongly in favor of that if we're kind of coordinating our regional approach with some of the upstream investments, I think it would only make sense there. And then regarding new providers, um, again, I, I get the interest in trying to encourage additional people to apply. Is there any other city RFP that you're aware of that we've ever gave given bonus points for someone who's never worked with the city before? So uh, the, the RFP process is new to me. We did do a lot of research um, in terms of other RFPs issued by the city um, and other communities. And um, not that it hasn't been done before, I'm not aware of it. Um, I, I did check in with purchasing finance department about this uh, to see if there were you know, any concerns around it. Um, raised similar ones and that we need to make sure that we define exactly what uh, you know, innovative program and new provider means. Um, for the evaluation committee, um, but that we have the flexibility to do so if we wanted to. I'm happy to do more research specifically on that question and see if there's other departments um, or other communities have done uh, or taken a similar approach. So, so to frame that question, just from my interest, because I, I really appreciate all the criteria there. And for me, it, it goes towards our mission of accomplishing getting to functional zero. I'm not sure giving someone bonus points for being a new provider helps us get to functional zero in a more efficient and effective manner. It, it may be, but that's just a new one for me. And then on um, in the application, page 21 of the application, we asked questions about 2.2 was working with government entities, and then 2.3 in the application was asking the applicants about staff training for racial equity, cultural humility, uh, strengths-based service delivery. During this criteria process, where would those questions that we're asking be evaluated in the process? So I think I'm looking at the criteria and, and then those sections in the RFP. So in terms of the uh, the training um, around diversity, equity, and 
inclusion, we'd be looking at that for strategic goals. Um, I think it would also fall under uh, organizational capacity, um, seeing that they have the infrastructure and experience um, you know, described in the RFP to deliver the services. And then in terms of their, the other one was about uh, working with other agencies and where we would be evaluating that. I could see that falling under a couple of the criteria, um, specifically under the first one, organi organizational capacity, um, and then also uh, probably with the reporting, because um, if we don't have direct experience with them, we can't look at their track record with us reporting, but maybe they've worked with the county um, or the continuum of care. I can reach out to those agencies and um, and see, you know, have they been submitting their report reports in a timely manner and what's been the quality of the, the data and their reports. So for me, does that answer your question? Uh, I, I guess my suggestion would be, since there's a study session, I think we, I would like to see more emphasis put on DEI work and using the model that city staff developed for the one-time monies. There were some specific criteria that resulted in a score. To lump DEI work with just 10 points strategic goal, which could potentially be 10%, I, I would think that's more of an emphasis given the council uh, conversations that we've had. Um, and more specific criteria. And again, I'm just thinking, having sat on some of these panels, that'd be a tough one to score without more specific criteria, almost like the innovative program versus promising practices. And I think those are all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Um, just to go back and, and look at the um, bonus points and the new provider and the functional, functional zero, I think, uh, to believe that we can achieve functional functional zero with only one provider um, is not a, a good belief. I think that everyone does not fit in in the same in the same space, and so the more providers that we have in our city, um, for me, means the more people that we can reach because it's different ways in which we can reach uh, different people, um, and so that would be a way to for me to, to look at it is uh, different organizations have different approaches as to how they reach people. So in the innovative realm, when we're looking at that is how are people going out uh, reaching um, the people that we are trying to reach? Um, and in this case, it happens to be um, our unhoused residents. So how are they going out to reach them? Some people don't want to work with people that um, have a religious background. So if it is Catholic Charities, they think Catholic Charities, religious background, I don't want to work with them. Well, we don't want people to have, to not get services because they have that perception. We want services to be available to all. So for me, functional zero means um, different services that are available, um, different types of same service, different providers uh, provided in a different way. So to me, that is how we reach functional zero, is how do we have different ways of reaching our unhoused residents um, and not trying to make them fit in what we perceive as the space that they need to fit in, but us trying to see how we fit into their lives and into their space um, to assist them with where they're at and where they need to go, not the other way around. So um, that was just my two cents on the functional zero. Thank you. So Kelly, I'm just uh, pulling this back to 50,000 feet uh, for the public that are watching the meeting. Can can you or, or uh, maybe Madam City Attorney walk through for us uh, who does the scoring what, what does the selection committee look like? And then what are the RFP requirements when this comes back to council in January? Uh, are we required to go with the highest score? Um, how will the, the ultimate decision be, be made? Maybe that's also a question for the city manager. I think it's probably um, a, a question of combined. Um, Kelly will have some of those answers in terms of the composition um, of the selection committee. Uh, but in general, there will be a committee that is appointed uh, to review 
um, the proposals um, and using these criteria that are set forth in the RFP, we'll evaluate uh, each of the applications um, and we'll give rankings. Uh, that ranking will come back to council. Um, the rankings are based on how well uh, the proposal meets uh, the criteria of the RFP and the intent of, uh, of the city in providing these services. Uh, it is not based, the ultimate recommendation will not be based on cost, it's based on the quality uh, of the proposal. Um, what will come to council will be a recommendation. Uh, the council has the discretion to either accept that recommendation uh, or move or, or move in us in a different direction. And Kelly, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that or correct anything I've said. Thank you. I would just add in terms of representation on the evaluation committee, this is uh, an item that we raised with our housing and homeless ad hoc committee. Uh, yesterday. Uh, again, that's uh, uh, Council Member Schwedhelm and Vice Mayor Rogers. And so we're working on putting that together. Um, and I assure you it will be a diverse representation uh, to include, of course, uh, city staff, um, uh, a couple of council members. Uh, there will also be um, representatives, at least in the draft list that we're putting together um, from our entitlement jurisdictions. So city of Petaluma. Um, the county as well, and then a number of other um, subject matter experts, which we're working to identify. So uh, a diverse a diverse panel, um, but with that criteria that is objective, so we can return to city council with uh, recommendations for providers based on that, the criteria that we're covering with you this afternoon. And I'll, I'll mention yeah. one other uh, category, um, uh, for membership on the committee was it was just on the uh, evaluation committee it was discussed yesterday uh, to include um, uh, those with lived experience. Great, thank you, Councilmember thank Sawyer. You You're on mute, John. Sorry about that. Again, um, I didn't read all. 70 pages of the RFP. It, it is a, uh, a very important and extensive document. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if, if I missed an area that might have included some scoring on um, the ability of an applicant to bring um, kind of leveraging, um, uh, addition, leveraging additional resources, um, not just the ones that come from the city, but because of their experience in this field, um, bringing other funding mechanisms into the program. Now, it may be in the RFP someplace that that is, although it may not be, uh, I mean, it'd be nice if it was scored, um, because I think it would be, especially in these, in this, these times of, of fiscal challenge, um, that somewhere in the scoring, even if it wasn't in a specific line, of scoring that it that it have to do with leveraging funds and bringing bringing more funds into the program based on their experience their their the respect they have in their in their uh, in their community wherever they may be, et cetera. So I was just wondering if there is any if you if you considered that or if there is anything in the RFP that in, that includes that. Thank you, Councilmember Sawyer. So in the um, one of the attachments to the RFP. Uh, the proposers are required to submit a budget that identifies all funding sources. So not just the funding that they're asking from the city. It doesn't specifically ask about, you know, how they're leveraging resources to, you know, to, to maximize uh, resources and implement their program. But I can certainly, since this is a draft, um, I can certainly make that change um, in the, the, the budget template that we're providing proposers that they speak to how they're leveraging resources to implement their programs and not just relying on the city. Okay, thank you. And the, and the other um, item that I had, is, it's just a comment. I, I've um, sat on a fair number of these um, committees. I've never seen a bonus for not having a relationship with the city. Um, I, and, and I mean, I could, if we were to attach bonus points to it, um, I would think that it wouldn't, uh, be an equal as wraparound services data reporting the strategic goals. Um, those seem pretty important. And 
um, actually rating it above client engagement and feedback. I mean, I just, I, I'm just a little, um, I've never seen that and I'm not necessarily, uh, it, 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 it seems inappropriate to me to be giving someone extra bonuses or extra points for never, never having had a re relationship with the city. Um, it's just, um, it rubs me the wrong way, quite frankly. Um, and I don't think that it, I, and especially when you talk about innovative, innovative could be synonymous with experimental. Um, how do you, you know, if, if there are innovative programs, I'd certainly like to know what they are um, and to have, you know, what is, what does innovation mean to, uh, to a particular provider of services? Um, I, would, I would need that quantified. Um, if you're going to offer 10% uh, of the scoring for something that's innovative, I would want it quantified. So that's just a, a comment. Um, thank you for clarifying the information on the um, the uh, leveraging of, of finances. So that's that's that is important. Um, and thank you for clarifying that. So that's all for now. Any other questions from council? Okay, we will go to public comment for this item. If you're interested in providing a comment, go ahead and either hit the raise hand feature on Zoom or go ahead and walk towards the microphone here in the chamber. I'll start with Shirley. Hello. There we go. Hello. Yeah, I'm Shirley Cheel. Um, I'm from the Homeless Task Force at First United Methodist Church. Um, under the scope uh, section in the RFP, I see a Community Homeless Assistance Program. Um, CHAP has allowed us to operate safe parking for many years. Initially, we received a CHAP grant, thank you, and have since been operating from donations. We've provided a place to park, installed lighting, cameras, volunteers regularly visit the site to cover security. Some of our guests have found housing. However, some have just languished for years, yes, years in our parking lot because of the lack of access to services and case management. It seems like after their initial intake, they have been forgotten and perhaps considered taken care of. This has led to a severe decline in their health and led to their extreme lack of trust in the system. I come before you to plead again for access to wraparound services and case management. Case management. We are not counselors, we are not housing locators, and we are not able to provide mental health or addiction support. I will repeat, those unhoused guests in safe parking under the city's CHAP program need full access to services. I am hoping that any proposal you receive will consider the needs of our unhoused guests and the volunteers operating programs under the CHAP program. At this time, we are certainly reluctant to take on new guests. You know we want to work with you. We want to be considered partners. Our goals are to support the unhoused and reach out and support the needs of the city, especially in the Roseland area where our property is located. Thank you for including CHAP in the scope of services. And then to answer the uh, Vice Mayor's point, we have never ever had any religious strings attached to any support we give the unhoused or the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley. Next is Devin. Evan, are you able to unmute? 
Okay, awesome. Hi, my name is Tamara Hernandez. Um, I've been homeless often, some 17 plus years. Um, that's actually long enough to term for the term homeless to be new to me. Um, before that, I was actually more closely identified with the word transient or indigent since it was attached to my name wherever it appeared. Such self-awareness grew to self-actualization. But after entering Sam Jones Hall, I was able to rest and heal and feel. The latter of these is what compels me to express my sincerest gratitude for the shelter and its staff. I still have not felt though that I've given my thanks enough to the folks who have made what's tangible in my life currently possible. So thank you, Santa Rosa City Councilmen and women for your action and work Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Um, through your action and work to designate funding here at Sam Jones Hall. Thank you because it provides the staff with who is so well-trained, not strained or overworked, who also have integrity and are well-suited for the hard work and people that they care for. I want you all to know this means a lot to me because it's made such a difference in my my life personally and many others um also thank you because the sam jones hall case managers the ones that i've met with and, and have worked closely with who assessed me and helped me with my full well-being like for instance medical dental mental health financial skills and you know after 17 years that's a big onion to peel <laughs> so you know they even even the uh, the bus tickets, for instance, to to help me follow through on on appointments outside. The housing navigators, where I was helped with my credit history, cleanup, uh, rental info, applications, fee waivers, their professional advice, even, which is priceless. So also, I, also sometimes they'd come in, you know, to my door just to just to say, hey, you know, you're eligible, and then they would assist me with the process. You know, they would keep me excited because it's it's work you know but anyway so you know wherever there's a rating list my name exists on it and that's that's so much hope it's, it's amazing also my thanks of your continued support and funding at sam jones hall because it goes so well beyond my study here such as for instance again my healthcare team my counseling service and all the support that goes with that so most important, my desire to live well is priceless. And please, by all means, continue to fund Sam Jones Hall because it, it, it changed lives. It's changed mine. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other hands for this study session? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. Uh, we'll start on Zoom. Councilmember Sawyer. Pardon me. Oh, I, my apologies. We have some voicemails. My name is Larry. I'm calling up regarding agenda item 3.1, Homeless Services Request for Pro Proposal. I was a participant at the drop-in center for a few years, and now I volunteer for Transitional Residential Program. I want to thank the city for making the drop-in center possible. And I want to thank the drop-in for all the help it has given me with this team. I'm able to help people living on the streets, have access to services, and whenever possible, help connect them with housing and op housing opportunities. The staff here feels like a family and have taught me a lot while I'm volunteering. They helped me with my own housing. This has been a big deal in my life and I hope it can be a big deal for many others. Thank you for ensuring this program can serve our community. Hello, my name is Michelle and I'm calling on Agenda 3.1. The Family Support Center has helped my family tremendously. I came to them broken, no home, part-time part -time work and on foot. The staff was welcoming and very directive. They opened my eyes to other avenues in my housing search, as well as the twins' education. 
They gave me support on days I wanted to give up. They were and are my advocates to a better future. The children's coordinator was so helpful with all of the kids, including mine. She got them on the busing system to and from school and after school programs like CHOPS. Continued support through the COVID-19, which was very tremendous to deal with. They gave us mental and emotional support. The meals and functions for families made a difficult situation seem more tolerable. My individual housing specializer was, ama was amazing. As I, as I sit in my own three bedroom, one and a half bath, as my son just came up to me and smiled as he explained to me how the Christmas tree will look good here in our own home. None of that would have been possible if it weren't for the funding that the Santa Rosa City Council had provided to the Family Support Center. Thank you. My family has truly been blessed by, by our city council. Thank you for all of your funding, and I pray that such great fundings can continue to help more families once again. And thank you so much for, all, for bringing us home, home for Christmas. Study session item 3.1, Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. The homeless services that are being provided by Catholic Charities at the Taxpayer Finance Samuel Jones Hall have sometimes fallen short and many people I've spoken with who live in the area feel that the homeless shelter has become problematic because many of the homeless spend a lot of time just out on the streets there and in a sense are a nuisance to the local residents who over a decade ago told the city that there shouldn't be more than 40 or 50 people there. And the city ignored that and apparently wants to put hundreds there. I can sympathize with folks who are homeless and I've known some of the people who've lived out there. One of the dilemmas is congregating all of the homeless in such a spot. I shouldn't say all of the homeless, but hundreds of the homeless in such a spot can be counterproductive. Scattered site homeless shelters throughout the city, one in each district, so everyone bears the burden, would be a much more equitable and helpful approach. Hopefully, the organization which is going to get this long-term contract would look into that instead of one big center there on the west side of town. Thank you. Uh, on 3.2, the groundwater sustainability plan, there are a number of people in Roseland who are on wells and they're real concerned the city hasn't really been involving the community well. The approach that the city takes is typically top down, doesn't really do bottom up involvement and claims some, tor some type of community engagement occurred. That's not really the case. It's just a situation of going through the motions, then saying that you've had a discussion with the community. There needs to be more to help these well owners out here in Roseland so they'll understand what you're going to do to them. Thank you. Mayor, that concludes public comment. Great. So I'll pull it back and we'll go to Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I've kind of made my comments. I, I, I am concerned about the um, the innovation piece and the new 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 relationship with the city piece. If if, if nothing else, I'd like to see it reduced to five points. If if it's if it's to be maintained at all, um, and I believe that. Well, first of all, let me thank um, all of those involved in coming up with what is. Um, to my mind, one of the most comprehensive RFPs that I've seen uh, in my experience. Uh, and I'm very pleased that it's coming forward because uh, in, in 2004, when we were, we were funding only the Sam Jones Center, and we felt that that was uh, enough at the time. Uh, we could not have, have anticipated the growth in our homeless and unsheltered population. Um, I think that this RFP addresses, um, I, I can't think of anything that it doesn't address. And that's really important because it's a, it's a very complex um, issue, a complex challenge to, to our city and to the region. Um, 
I hope that the rest of our partners uh, in the county can uh, come up with the same kind of of, of uh, RFP in, in their in their own right and help us with this this very difficult and challenging uh, problem. But uh, thank you for coming up with the, that very comprehensive RFP, and I look forward to um, seeing the results um, of the when the once the applicants are reviewed. Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in, in the paper a couple of days ago, there was there was there was an article where, where it stated that smaller cities are now stepping forward with their own homeless or transient or uh, population. Uh, has there been communication between us, the city of Santa Rosa, and with our smaller cities here in, in Sonoma County? That would be my first question. I have another follow-up question after. So, it, certainly, you know, we're working really closely with the county. Um, and as you're aware, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, seats on the continuum of care. So, you know, and that's a regional body. So that would be our, you know, connection with, with the county and our regional partners. And in being more in the know and coordinating, collaborating with uh, other cities in Sonoma County, um, assistant uh, interim assistant city manager, Claire Hartman, is also in a number of meetings with county staff and then staff and representatives from the other cities throughout the county to understand more about you know what they're doing to address this issue so uh, there are um, there's work underway to both increase uh, communication throughout the county as well as coordination thank you Kelly. And, and the second question i had for you is, is there a mechanism in place where if we see that one rfp proposal does great in one section such as the housing, but then we find another RFP proposal that's great in the outreach aspect. Is there anything in place where we could actually incorporate both entities or is it pretty much under one and then they would do the, the subcontracting to another entity within within our county for per se? So if I'm understanding your question, I think that there, we anticipate working with multiple providers uh, not just one provider, as I covered in the study session, or at least in the presentation, we are working with multiple providers at the moment. Some of those providers have skills in other areas and the scope of our contracts. Uh, for example, Sam Jones Hall, that's emergency shelter, right? But it, it goes beyond that because there's case management services there to help uh, individuals move into housing. Um, and same with, same with street outreach. It's more than just street outreach. There are other components to that. So that can be... Um, you know, defined in the scope. Um, in the RFP, we are asking the, the applicants, the proposers to define, you know, what program specifically they're applying for. Um, but there is some flexibility once we get to, if they're selected, once we get to contract negotiation. And also for those providers to subcontract out services if needed. And I hope that answers your question. If not, I can try to clarify no, further. No, 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 it doesn't. Thank you for the, for the clarification on, on my question. Thank you, Kelly. Council Member Fleming. Thank you for your great work. I think you did a fantastic job and I support it as is. Council Member Swedel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks again, Kelly, for doing this. Again, I did read all 71 pages and I know a lot of work went in behind this. Um, and I think we're doing something that I think will add years of value to our community. So feedback on this, um, I'm not in favor of the innovative program language. I am in favor of using promising practices consistent with upstream investment. And just for the rest of the council, um, with it, it, on the county's website, it, I'll just use the introductory paragraph. In the upstream portfolio, an evidence-informed practice is designed using recognized theory and research, shows evidence of positive outcomes, and is being evaluated for its impact on our local community. To me, if I'm on the panel, as Mr. Sawyer said, I've been on a lot of these panels, that gives me some framework versus innovative practices. So I'd be in favor of doing uh, evidence-informed practice or promising practices. I would also like to see some language for the criteria about organizations experience dealing in COVID and disasters, because many of us on council experienced some of the adjustments we had to make, even with Sam Jones Hall, when your food service provider closed it down and they had to come up with some things that I know some of us on council helped them with that. But getting experience and 
hearing what agencies have done about responding to the pandemic and some of our recent emergencies, I think that's very, um, I think be very important because unfortunately I think we'll probably experience that in the next five years. And then the uh, last thing is, I, I, I just don't see the reason why we would give bonus points for a new provider. And one of the reasons I say that, because I really think it's a shared responsibility, being willing to work with anyone. And I'll use my experience on another panel with the continuum of care, where we had uh, HUD funding, half a million dollars come to the community, and CDC staff, we did not have enough people interested in applying for those dollars. Were there strings attached? Absolutely. Federal government HUD guidelines. But they had to reach out to some of the experienced providers who were willing to take that risk and apply. But the opportunity was there for any other agency to help in this effort. And so that's the shared responsibility I'm talking about. So the money was offered. Some people chose to accept that, some did not. And so I'm just not sure how that's going to help us. And I totally respect other folks' opinion on this. But to give bonus points for a new provider, it just doesn't make uh, evidence-based sense to me. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Um, thank you for the time in uh, putting this together and even putting together an RFP because I know we have not had one um, in a long time for homeless services. So just for putting one together. Um, and I guess I, I do um, encourage us to look at um, additional providers for the the reasons why I specified um, because I, I do think we need a variety of providers to a, assist and support the needs of the variety of the unhoused residents that we have because they are not all alike and they all have different different needs um, and I just want to thank you for all your hard work. I know uh, firsthand that you've been working very diligently and putting a lot of work and effort into this. So thank you very much. Yeah, I want to echo those comments, Kelly. I know you've been uh, asked to do a lot with a little, and we're very grateful for the work that you're doing. Uh, I have read all 71 pages of the RFP as well. Uh, it is very thorough, and I can appreciate how much effort went into it. Uh, I'm not going to be supportive of the uh, new provider language. Uh, to me, to me, it starts with the presupposition that our providers are not doing an adequate job. And a 10% bonus to somebody who's never worked with the city is a significant advantage when the entire scoring criteria is only 100 points. Uh, I want each of the proposals to stand on their own merit based on where we've gotten to today with our evolution of our focus, our services, our budget, uh, and our ideology around homelessness, what can each of those providers give to the city of Santa Rosa to help us with one of our priority issues? Uh, I don't care if that is an existing provider. I don't care if that's a new provider. The only thing that I care about in that equation is who's going to actually help get folks housed and who's going to be able to deliver the terms of the RFP and what we're looking for in terms of the scope. Uh, so I understand that the thought process, and I, I agree that we do need uh, diversity of providers, and it, I know that we have new providers who have started to pop up. Let their work stand for itself. Don't give them an automatic bump up uh, just simply because they're new. Um, with that, do you have the direction that you need from council? I do have one question. I just want to clarify. So what I'm hearing is um, for the bonus points, do away with the new provider component of that. I want to add that that doesn't exclude new providers from applying for the RFP. It's open to any providers. So suggest that we remove the new provider. We keep the bonus points for innovative approaches, but we reduce it to five points um, and that these innovative approaches um, must uh, expand on engagement opportunities and housing outcomes. Um, and we need to further define it um, related to promising practices and, and evidence-based practices. Uh, how does that sound to the, the council? I can make those changes in the RFP and the criteria. I'd be supportive of that, but I'll look to my colleagues to see thumbs up or comments.
Councilmember Alvarez? Uh, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Uh, in, in regards to the five points, I, I think innovative, I think one, one of my fellow colleagues said it very well. I, innovative means um, without without experience, without proven proven uh, results. I believe that that in the in the request itself, anyone that is is submitting a proposal would love to share their ideas that have a proven track record, regardless if they're they one they are one with, that we've already worked with or one that we've never worked with. So it, it's aligned with the ten points for the bonus points. I, I simply would like to see the 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 innovation, proven innovation, without having to give it extra points. I, I think that's just on on the merit of them trying to having tried different things that they can prove are working. So I, I don't feel that we should we should uh, give them an extra points for that when it should be upon themselves. Okay. Vice Mayor. Um this may just be not accurate, but when we were looking at how do we apply the DEI to our framework, when we were looking at the budget stuff, that's something that we had never done. That's something that, and we had to figure out a way, how were we gonna apply it? What was it gonna look like? Okay, well, us just even having staff look at that was an innovative way of having staff look at it. How are we gonna do it? How are we gonna apply it? That's being innovative, thinking out of the box. How are we gonna do it? So it's, it's kind of thinking out of the box the same way and how are you gonna approach things differently because times are changing, we're looking at things differently, things are not the same. So how are we gonna go about doing things differently because things are changing? It's the same principle. People are changing, times are changing, things are changing. We are not the same. We cannot do things the way we did them 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Shoot, we can't do things the way we did them five years ago. So we need to think out of the box. If we're going to get to functional zero, which is our goal, then we need to find a way to get there. If we had the key to get there, guess what, you guys? We would have already been there. But obviously, we don't have the key and we don't have what we needed to get there. So why don't we open it up? to hear people out and see what's out in the community, thoughts of people, <laughs> like what they have, what they can bring forward to get us to what our goal is. I don't wanna like cut anyone short about what they could possibly bring to us to get us to where our goal is because we're saying, oh, we've never seen that before, where there's a lot of stuff we probably haven't seen before, but that doesn't, mean that it's not gonna help to get us to where we wanna go. It means that we need to get not stuck in our ways and to get out of this box that we think we need to be in because I don't wanna be in the box anymore. I wanna move forward and I wanna get to functional zero, so. Go ahead, council member. Yeah, um, I agree with the vice mayor. I think we're in a situation of that expression, uh, you need ID to get ID, you know, where if you want to propose something and you don't have a track record, I mean, obviously we're not going to take wild, crazy ideas, but if somebody wants to propose something new and innovative, um, there's no way to gather data or information on something until you get an opportunity to try it. So, um, and that's, that's what we do in social work. That's how we apply our principles, but you have to have rigorous data and testing and, and met metrics. and. One of the things that I saw in the RFP is a, a strong uh, data component. So I'm not too worried that if we get something and we try it and it doesn't work, that, that that's gonna be, not gonna be a huge problem. We are a council that says, we'll try something. If it doesn't work, we'll change it. And I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in our staff's ability to monitor that and to, to work with whoever um, is awarded contracts to that end. I, go ahead, Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I was just wanted to hear Councilmember Schwedhelm's. Uh, he was referring to the county to a county program, or something that you were looking um, to have added to the um, RFP. Could you articulate that again for me? You okay, Mr. Mayor? If I do that, it's regarding the uh, the county's upstream investment portfolio. 
And my understanding is when there is funding available, there's different categories that organizations can fund uh, or apply for funding for. And there are some evidence-based, but there are those promising practices, which for me, that's what I'm hearing, the language we've been talking about is innovative program. And so upstream investments have clearly defined it so that people who are applying, there's four criteria here, a literature review, a logic model, a manual, and an evaluation plan, which again helps those organizations that may be new to the game. Here's the criteria that you can use that we're gonna evaluate the effectiveness of your program. Because I think the issue is with upstream, if we had unlimited funding, knock yourself out, let's fund everything, but we don't. So what's the most efficient and effective investment? And that's what I think Upstream Investments has designed with this. And that category for innovation is under promising practices and the criteria is there. And with homelessness, we're going with a regional approach. Upstream Investments is a regional approach. And I just think it'd be wonderful if we're consistent with the language. So those nonprofit providers also understand, here's a criteria that we need to develop to be consistent because doing all this, working on all this together, our odds of success are much greater. Thank you for that, and, and I actually agree with that. It does help when when um, scoring these RFPs to have some clear language to bounce your scoring off of. So um, I, I would, if we can get that in there, I, I don't see a downside to quantifying and qualifying um, that up, whatever upstream investment one of our uh, respondents would have. I think that would be uh, prudent. So I think, uh, Kelly, I think I heard from you three different potential changes. So I think what would actually just be helpful is if we go through and do a straw poll on each of those three individually. What I heard was removing a uh, new provider from that bonus category. I heard lowering it from 10 points to five points. And then I also have heard a desire from council to either keep it broad and uh, as innovation or to give some form of structure to it by adopting the promising practices model that the county uses for their funding. So if it works for council, let's walk through those three components to see where we're at on them because uh, we might actually be in agreement or have some form of direction and just be talking past one another. Uh, Councilmember Alvarez, did you have a question before I do that? Uh, it was more of a comment for clarification, Mayor, if, if I may. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I think I think we're, 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 to clarify my statement, it, it wasn't so much that, that, that we want to hear about the diversity, equity, inclusion, but I like the language where it says alignment with city council priorities. I, I, I like I like that much more than hearing or giving points to to innovative ideas, and, and I think I like more the language of of aligning aligning itself with with our priorities, and I think that's where we're probably more definition on that. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's do quick straw poll first. Uh, show of thumbs: Are people comfortable with removing the new provider language from the bonus category? Okay, so I'm saying four thumbs for that. Uh, are folks comfortable with reducing the number from 10 to five for the bonus category? Okay, I'm seeing four votes for that. Uh, and then uh, is council comfortable leaving the language broader and having it be based on innovation uh, let's see thumbs for that. And, and again, the alternative thumbs down means uh, put in place the promising practices structure as opposed to leaving it a little bit broader. So thumbs up if you're okay with it being broader, thumbs down if you'd prefer the promising practices language. And I'm seeing no thumbs from people. <laughs> so, so I'm guessing that that means that there's clarity that needs to happen there. So Councilmember Sawyer gave a thumbs down. So you're in favor of the promising practices language. Yes, yes um, because of the ability to quantify it, qualify it, and, and rate it, and, and uh, place a, a, um, a score next to it. That's, that's really the, the main reason that, I'm, that, that that's what I'm looking at. Okay. 
Uh, Councilmember Alvarez. Well, really, no comment, Mayor. Um, I, I agree with 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 the statements of, of removing uh, the bonus points, lowering the 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 bonuses. So, so no, uh, no, other, no other comment on that. So you have no direction on the innovative language versus the promising practices structure. The, the innovative language again. I, I would much rather see aligned with count, city council uh, priorities. And, and I think that that it, it's upon it's, I believe that's upon the, the RFP proposal to to align the strategies with ours. And I'd almost say without us having to tell them to see where they go with it. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. OK, uh, Council Member Fleming. I have to admit that um, while what Council Member Schwedhelm suggests is suggest sounds fantastic i don't under i don't i'm not familiar enough with it to make a recommendation that differs from staffs at this point in time and that's where i'm at with it okay council member Swedham. i support the promising practices definition that the county is using with upstream investments okay and vice mayor I would feel more comfortable if we didn't just, if the committee didn't just come back with one recommendation. That's not an answer to your question, but that's my answer. Um, yeah. Because I feel like it's too narrow in scope. So, yeah. And I think that's probably what my problem is more than anything, is I feel like when they come back with one recommendation, um, I just don't, I, I would feel more comfortable if there is more than one that they come back with more than one recommendation in the notes from the committee on, uh, the notes on, from the committee, and then allow us to, to pick the provider. But narrowing it down, if that's what it takes, but um, not to just come back with one. I think that's too narrowly focused. Okay. So I'm not much, I'm not hearing much consensus on the council around the promising practices framework versus leaving it more broad. Um, I'm going to suggest that the council leave it broad if we can get there. And then I know that a number of providers will watch this study session and perhaps trying to figure out how best to be able to demonstrate that their innovative idea is worthwhile, perhaps they will adopt uh, the promising practices or some other type of structure and then make the best case that they can to the, the folks who are going to be judging the RFPs. Um, I, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Can I get some thumbs? All right, let's move that direction then. And I and, and will note the vice mayor's um, desire to see uh, multiple operators uh, and also uh, obviously we won't just see one provider score coming back but we'll see the scores for all of the providers that submit for the RFP yep, go for it um, and I just would like to make a comment that I I think I can well, I'll speak on behalf of myself, that I am very thankful for the providers that we do have in the community. I think that we have some really great providers in the community, and I'm very thankful um, for the providers that we do have in the community. So I, I don't want anyone to take my comments as if I am ungrateful um, for the providers that we have in the community. Um, I just like to advocate for <laughs> uh, us to have a variety of providers to to get to everyone that we want to um, provide services to, um, no matter if I stand alone in advocating for that. I just that I will stand alone to advocate for that, but I think that that is very important. But I am grateful to the provider. So if you can pass that along, I would appreciate that, Kelly. Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think that we are going to be seeing from the applicants 
to this or respondents to this RFP um, a great deal of innovation. It's been almost 20 years since uh, we started down this path. And my guess is that not a, not a single respondent, if, if, if they don't use innovation in their responses, I don't think they're gonna get very far. So that, that would be my guess, given how much time has passed and how important this is and how much change has been made in, in how uh, communities address this challenge, I think there will be a high level, I'm expecting, I'm hoping a high level of innovation from all of our respondents. Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you, Mayor. On, on my, and, and again, speaking for myself, for me, you know, we, we've become so accustomed to these key words that, that spark DEI. And for myself, I would love to see what comes from the proposals and, and with, from, from within themselves, that they don't just pick up on those key words that, that check boxes off. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for. I definitely want to see the innovation, but because it comes from them, and I'm really excited, and I can't wait to see the proposals that come forward. Thank you, Council Member. All right, Kelly, thank you so much, and we'll see this again in January when the, when the uh, providers come back. Thanks, Mayor Rogers, if I may, just quickly, I, I know that DEI was a theme throughout the study session this afternoon. I just want to add that um, I'll be sure to include our staff member, Socorro Shields, uh, while we're fleshing out the criteria, and I'm inviting her right now to be on the evaluation committee. So I know that it's very important to the council, and we'll make sure it's part of the process moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. City Manager, let's do 3.2. Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council, item 3.2 is our second study session item of the afternoon. The matter before the Council is the Santa Rosa Plain Draft Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Peter Martin, our Deputy Director of Water Resources, will be um, presenting the staff presentation. And this is a, a time sensitive matter. Uh, the plan has to be submitted by January 31st of 2022 and it's going before the uh, Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agents Authority Board uh, in December of 2021. So your input uh, will be valuable for staff to incorporate in the process. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Mr. City Manager. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Rogers and uh, members of the council. Uh, yeah, definitely appreciate the opportunity to be before you today. Uh, to talk about this regional planning effort that's uh, taken over two years uh, and um, recently culminated in the release of a public draft uh, for uh, a review last month. So um, if we go to the next slide. So uh, in terms of what I'd like to cover today, uh, I was hoping to cover, you know, just in general, uh, the Sustainable Management Groundwater Management Act, also known as SIGMA uh, and the requirements of that. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about just kind of giving an overview of who the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency is. Uh, and then today I'll just kind of give a real good uh, overview of the elements of this draft groundwater sustainability plan. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the public input process and uh, next steps as well. Next slide. So uh, to quickly orient you with um, you know, as the city and others in the region became involved and in, in how we became involved in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and carrying out the planning elements and the groundwater sustainability planning efforts uh, necessary to meet state mandates. Um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was a landmark piece of state legislation uh, introduced in 2014 uh, in response to rapidly declining groundwater levels uh, throughout California. Um, and it was continuing to create a wide variety of issues, uh, specifically uh, in the Central Valley, um, especially uh, economic uh, water supply and water quality issues, uh, in addition to environmental and environmental justice issues that were getting quite a bit of uh, press at the time. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, these were most prominent in the wide swaths in the Central Valley, and they did receive quite a bit of attention at that time. Uh, typically, California policies regarding groundwater supplies and access to groundwater have not been as tightly controlled or regulated as our surface water supplies, for instance. Um, you know, there are some limited exceptions uh, with legally adjudicated groundwater basins, but in general, uh, the right to access groundwater resides with the overlying property and the well owner. Um, so that means that for the most part, 
Uh, California does not have a permit process for regulation of groundwater use, and groundwater use doesn't require approval from the State Water Resources Control Board or court, uh, similar to a water right, a surface water right. Um, so you can see how this kind of wrinkle led to the overdrafting of certain basins in the state. Um, but Sigma ultimately tasked uh, local agencies with uh, managing their groundwater resources at a local level uh, in a sustainable manage manner on a 20 to 50 year planning horizon. Uh, the first thing it required uh, was local agencies to form what they call groundwater sustainability agencies uh, in all uh, designated high and medium priority groundwater basins and sub-basins. And that was required to be done by June 30th of 2017. Um, Santa Rosa Water and other agencies in the region with jurisdictional boundaries and authorities uh, formed a ground, uh, joint powers authority to act as a groundwater sustainability agency or GSA in the basin. Um, and it's now known as the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency. So the legislation also required sort of these comprehensive groundwater sustainability plans be created. Uh, and then they be created also in a transparent public process and definitely imposed timelines for the adoption of these plans. Um, so basins that were designated as critically overdrafted were required to be uh, delivered by January, 2020. Um, this basin here is designated as a medium priority basin and thus must have a plan in place by January 31st of 2022. So um, as you were aware, the GSA is in the process of finalizing their plan for adoption by the end of the year. Next slide. So just to kind of give you an idea of where the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency boundary is, uh, it encompasses approximately 80,000 acres and is generally bounded by uh, the low-lying hills of the Mendocino Range uh, on the east and, uh, oh, excuse me, on the, on the west and then um, by the uh, Snow Mountains and the Myakimus Mountains on the east. Uh, the subbasin is approximately 22 miles long and the width varies uh, from approximately nine miles um, through the Santa Rosa area, for instance, uh, to six miles wide at the south end, uh, and then kind of narrows uh, greatly at the end near Katati. Uh, the subbasin the sub includes uh, the town of Windsor, cities Katati, Runner Park, Santa Rosa, and Sebastopol, and areas of unincorporated rural communities and a lot of agricultural cultivation as well. So the principal streams here in this basin are Mark West Creek, Santa Rosa Creek, and the Laguna de Santa Rosa, which uh, ultimately drain a combined watershed of approximately 251 uh, square miles. Next slide. So um, the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency, as I mentioned earlier, was is a joint powers authority comprised of the representatives uh, from the city of Santa Rosa, city of Katati, uh, city of Runner Park, city of Sebastopol, and the town of Windsor. Uh, the County of Sonoma, Sonoma Water, uh, and the Sonoma and Gold Ridge Resource Conservation Districts. Yeah. And also there is a representative from several in, independently owned water systems in the basin that also utilize groundwater. Um, the advisory committee of this uh, agency is comprised of representatives from those same members that I mentioned above, uh, but additionally has community members with diverse perspectives on uh, beneficial groundwater use, and that also includes uh, representatives from agriculture, uh, the environmental community, the business community, rural residents and rural well users, and also public water districts. So um, you have the board of directors and that advisory committee um, has configured there. Um, and the GSA itself also has several staff and technical consultants that administer uh, the many activities of the GSA uh, including creating the groundwater sustainability plan, uh, which we're going to be talking about today. And overall, just generally carrying out the, the directives of the board and the various public processes involved. Um, your, your representative for the city of Santa Rosa on the board of directors is uh, council member Tom Schwedhelm, uh, who also happens to serve as a chair of the board of directors and council member John Sawyer is the uh, alternate. Next slide. So, um, uh, in a general sense, uh, there are sort of three important steps required as part of SIGMA. 
that is sort of outlined in this graphic. Uh, the last time we were before this council uh, between 2015 and 2017, uh, a groundwater sustainability agency was being formed as required by law. And uh, the city has thus uh, participated in that joint powers authority since 2017. Um, and since then, that GSA has been focused primarily on step two here, um, development of a groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, and that's where we are today with the final draft having been circulated last month and a final document being proposed for adoption by the GSA board on December 9th. And after that, step three is gonna be uh, having the, the GSA implement that plan and ultimately ensure that the basin achieves sustainability um, as defined by Sigma on a 20 year time frame. Next slide. So I was gonna uh, stay at a pretty high level, but I would like to talk a little bit about the elements of this plan. Um, you know, it is about an 800 to a thousand page document with all the appendices. Uh, I don't anticipate that this council will dive into that too much, but I do wanna give uh, just definitely an overview of some of the independent elements of this plan. Um, Sigma does mandate that specific elements are going to be addressed in this plan uh, before it can be submitted and approved uh, by the State Department of Water Resources. Um, so first, the plan must have a very comprehensive description of the basin and the aquifer, uh, sort of including the hydrogeologic characteristics uh, land uses and various other sort of important descriptors that can orient someone as to the conditions occurring in the basin. And so uh, the plan also must identify uh, sustainability indicators and objectives and goals um, specifically tailored to our local basin and address uh, how the region plans to meet the goals of sustainability on a 20 year planning horizon and beyond. And of course, uh, with those indicators and objectives, uh, it'll outline how we'll prevent um, the groundwater basin from sliding into various uh, specific undesirable results in the future. And then um, the plan needs to lay out various actions the GSA will undertake to achieve sustainability goals in terms of projects um, and management actions. And then of course, uh, we're gonna need to develop a wide ranging monitoring plan uh, to determine the long-term health of the basin and see how we're doing with achieving the goals outlined in the plan and ensuring success in the future. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned, one of the required elements of the plan is a uh, sort of a, a piece uh, of, that's sort of description setting um, and highlights the important geographic and hydrological elements of the Santa Rosa Plain subbasin. Um, this sort of not only includes just the complex technical water resources and geological related discussions, but you know definitely covers things like political jurisdictions that may exist within the boundary of the GSA uh, and the area that the GSB covers, and you know things like current land use designations throughout the entire area. Um, it should be noted that the Santa Rosa Plain Subbasin uh, does sort of have a particularly complex geology. Uh, there's many fault lines that bisect the subbasin, um, and, and that, that, that does come into play when uh, developing this plan. Uh, and as you can imagine, things like uh, land use uh, can also affect uh, water quantity and quality uh, throughout the basin as well. So um, this plan sort of also separates out into two aquifers. There is a, a shallow aquifer, um, existing of approximately 200 feet or less, um, and then um, a deep aquifer that is uh, below that 200 feet threshold. Um, these are considered unique and therefore will need uh, special consideration in that plan uh, for future protection and establishing future uh, planning goals as well. Next slide. So in all, there are an estimated 7,000 wells, groundwater wells in the basin, um, and they generally fall into three category sectors, uh, rural domestic, municipal wells, and agriculture. Um, the estimated demands uh, by these sectors are displayed in that pie chart there, with about 50% of the use being applied to rural domestic users. Those are 
uh, folks that have you know independent groundwater wells uh, in rural areas and are not connected to municipal uh, systems like ours and then 32 percent to agriculture and then another 18 percent to municipal uh, users as well next slide so uh, by law the plan must include a water budget and hydrogeologic model um, this budget really is sort of a an inventory of all inflow and outflow or kind of the supply and demand um, of the groundwater uh, total groundwater basin and this plan sort of includes a summary of both surface water and groundwater budgets uh, you, you know as you can imagine they are na naturally linked uh, in the water cycle as well so and, you know using this budget the plan is is able to input this into a model and really kind of forecast out and evaluate the potential changes in groundwater storage with you know projected changes in things like you know climate um, land use designations and many other supply and demand considerations over this sort of 20 to 50 year planning horizon next slide so this is just a real basic or it's actually not very basic but it's a, sort of a complex illustration of the various potential inflows and outflows that create the water budget um, you know these include the various support inputs you sort of know about like rainfall and stream and other you know irrigation inputs but you know also the losses that occur from things like evaporation or you know the municipal domestic and agricultural uh, demands that I highlighted earlier. Um, you know, so these inputs in this plan were sort of robustly calculated for the plan in order to gain a critical understanding and picture of what's going on underneath our feet uh, with this groundwater basin and uh, how it'll look in the future. So um, next slide. So this uh, graphic here just sort of shows a little more detail of some of those inflows and, and outflows uh, in, in terms of just describing them. Uh, you know, just in general, it should be highlighted this plan. For this plan, there are three water budgets um, that are required to be developed for the GSP. And, uh, you know, those are sort of the historical conditions, those being uh, from 1976 to 2018, uh, when this planning effort started. And then the current conditions, which uh, would cover you know 2012 to 2018, and then of course where the modeling comes in, um, you know there's projected conditions, uh, how they would occur over a 50-year planning and implementation horizon of this plan. So uh, that would cover you know sort of 2021 to 27. Next slide. So the plan will show that going forward. Uh, you know, total groundwater storage is projected to sort of stabilize during these extended wet periods uh, based on some climate models. And then eventually it will decline during long-term droughts. Uh, you know, obviously with uh, projected demands and increases in demand, uh, changes to land use and our climate, uh, the plan does project a long-term deficit of about 200 acre feet per year between now and 2040 and 1400 acre feet by uh, 2070. So, you know, for comparison, the three sectors are using an estimated 17,000 to 20,000 acre feet of water on average right now. So, you know, this is a deficit. Um, it's not something that has to be fixed right away, but it's something that's projected and has to be monitored. And it's one of the things that the GSA will need to overcome uh, ultimately to achieve long term sustainability in the basin and ensure protection of water supplies. I should mention this is all obviously projected uh, based on a model, um, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a lot that, you know, remains to be uh, figured out in terms of uh, what that deficit will look like. Next slide. So, uh, you know, the plan must address how the basin is going to ensure that we achieve sustainability long term in the basin. And there are these uh, six sustainability indicators that must be addressed in the plan and they're the anchors of this groundwater sustainability plan and really uh, these indicators will be how we determine success on the 20-year planning horizon um, you know these six indicators are the issues that sort of could pop up and must be addressed long term and the plan includes sort of 
very important thresholds and you know for how we'll know that these indicators uh, are being addressed and ensure that there will be no harm uh, to the beneficial users uh, of the groundwater basin. Uh, and then the plan, you know, as I mentioned, you know, must create these sort of minimum thresholds and measurable objectives, you know, that are tailored around each of these individual indicators. Uh, in some cases, you know, these thresholds and objectives may not be directly measured. Um, and so you can, uh, in some instances, use proxy measurements to determine progress in achieving uh, sustainability. So uh, a good example would be uh, you know, sort of reduction in overall groundwater storage. You could perhaps use uh, monitoring of groundwater levels to determine if that storage is reducing uh, long term. So uh, it also should be noted that seawater intrusion uh, is not a concern in this basin due to it, the basin not obviously being proximal to uh, saline water inputs. So it was not directly addressed in this plan. Next slide. So uh, each of these six sustainability indicators have three primary sustainable management criteria terms. Um, these are the undesirable results and minimum thresholds and measurable objectives. You know, obviously the top two sort of define uh, what is an unacceptable range uh, uh, for these indicators in the basin and determine, you know, long term whether the basins can be managed sustainably. So uh, a good example, as I mentioned earlier, would be uh, groundwater levels. If you're seeing groundwater levels continually declining, uh, you set a threshold to where that is no longer acceptable and the GSA needs to step in and take proactive measures. And so the, the measurable objectives are the term which sort of defines, uh, you know, what's desirable within the basin and really kind of overarching what the GSA must strive to achieve uh, long term. Next slide. And then uh, lastly, a monitoring plan. Um, the, the groundwater sustainability plan must include a you know, robust monitoring plan to ensure uh, you know, the objectives are being met and established thresholds are not being exceeded um, throughout the, the 20 year planning horizon. So you know, data will be extracted utilizing, utilizing sort of these networks of dedicated monitoring wells, um, various land use and water monitoring tools uh, that are publicly available. Next slide. So as you can see here, uh, the plan, you know, would include a network of monitoring points uh, in groundwater wells and dedicated groundwater monitoring points uh, that are tailored to address the needs of those two aquifers that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, both the shallow and deep zones that exist throughout the basin. Um, there's a total of 34 potential representative monitoring points that are being included in this monitoring plan, uh, with 18 of those um, being in the shallow zone and 16 in the deep zones. Uh, and you know, also in this plan, with this monitoring plan, you must identify any areas of the basin where data gaps may exist too. So that would be identified and potentially incorporated into future plans for monitoring as well. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And then, um, yeah, so finally, the, the groundwater sustainability plan must, uh, you know, identify and describe project concepts and management actions that are going to achieve sustainability long term. You know, this will help ensure that uh, those deficits I mentioned potentially earlier are not going to be problemat problematic in the future for the region. Um, you know, the, the plan specifically includes a prioritized and phased approach to projects and management actions to be implemented. Um, you know, some of those include the things above, like, you know, addressing data gaps through monitoring or other technological advances, uh, potential voluntary water use efficiency measures, you know, much like we do water use efficiency here at the city uh, in the water department, we could be expanding that to rural well owners uh, in the region. You know, obviously there's opportunities here for stormwater recharge or, you know, large farm scale or other large scale options exist as well. Uh, aquifer storage and recovery is something that has been discussed at length. And then, you know, obviously there's other 
a option for mandatory actions for well users. That's uh, conservation, uh, you know, or cutbacks to uh, groundwater use. So I'll talk a little bit more in detail about a couple of these uh, concepts um, that are in the plan in the next couple slides here. Uh, next slide. So stormwater recharge at a very high level, um, you know, is known that it can be used to recharge groundwater through sort of these small basins, and some of them are, you know, also these large on and off stream, um, you know, basins that can essentially allow water to percolate and recharge. Um, and, you know, it's also shown promise in certain areas of the region uh, in terms of, you know, flooding uh, permanent crops uh, at times when, uh, there's a lot of water available as well. So uh, next slide. And then the concept of aquifer storage and recovery is something that is, uh, has been discussed at length in this plan. Uh, it's sort of a temporary storage of surface water underground when surface water is plentiful. Uh, you know, water at a, at a basic level is recharged through wells um, and directly into the target aquifer and during wet or surplus periods and then pumped out um, for beneficial use in times like we're experiencing now during a drought or other you know, sort of peak need periods as well. Next slide. So if nothing, I, I think the most important takeaway I'd really like to convey today about this groundwater sustainability plan is that it is very much meant to be adaptive. Um, these plans are sort of the first of their, of their kind uh, in response to that legislation uh, in 2014. And as you can imagine, there remain significant data gaps and hurdles uh, we need to better uh, formulate and understand in terms of framing up what the groundwater management needs are of, this, of, of the region. Um, and, you know, the plan sort of establishes these defined goals and objectives, and they're, they're very global, but it definitely allows the GSA to um, sort of continually check in on the various requirements um, for reaching sustainability. And there are very obvious off-ramps um, in this plan if things start to become problematic in terms of our water, water quantity or quality or other issues. Um, you know, and then the GSA very much has the ability to adapt and change course, adjust and institute, you know, any variety of actions in the future uh, that are in the plan to address issues over this 20 year planning horizon uh, and of course beyond. So um, let's go to the next slide. So just to kind of take it all home, I imagine the council may be asking more specifically what the effects of this groundwater sustainability plan are on the city of Santa Rosa. You know, most importantly, the plan will ensure the protection of groundwater supplies uh, for Santa Rosa water and well users uh, within Santa Rosa. Um, you know, the, the plan will have impacts uh, in that um, coordination on land use decisions in the region uh, now need to occur with the GSA. Uh, an example would be the city needs to notify the GSA of any proposals substantially amend a general plan. This is all by law. And they must review and consider uh, any adopted groundwater plan and potentially uh, any comments from the GSA when amending the general plan. So uh, something new uh, is coming on as well. But, um, you know, and then groundwater users, uh, you know, fees to implement the groundwater sustainability plan uh, will be placed on municipal and private wells, uh, mostly based on usage. Um, the council may already be familiar, but with in, in June 2018, the board of the GSA directed staff to sort of develop a fee structure um, and approved a fee in June of 2019. Um, rural residential users are considered de minimis and they would pay under this previously adopted fee $9.95 per year. And large groundwater users uh, like the city uh, would pay uh, $19.98 per acre foot of water pumped annually. Um, but this fee is going to be revisited uh, and instituted likely, um, it's proposed to be instituted likely in the next fiscal year uh, to support the future implementation of the groundwater sustainability plan. Um, during this planning process, 
uh, the cities and towns and the county as well agreed to pick up the tab uh, for the planning effort, but any future implementation would need to be spread across all groundwater users. And then and finally, um, the plan includes uh, sort of these conceptual multi-jurisdictional projects, you know, that could be implemented to secure uh, the groundwater supply for the future. And the city really could participate in those if they choose to, there may be uh, benefits. Uh, but the plan, you know, notably does not obligate the city to participate uh, in any future conceptual projects. Uh, those projects, of course, would have to go through rigorous environmental review uh, and other things as well. So let's go to the last slide here. So I just wanna cover some of the next steps. Um, you know, a public draft was released on October 1st and two public workshops were held virtually to receive public input on the plan. Um, this public comment period has now concluded and staff of the GSA are working to address some of the comments um, by, you know, sort of improving certain sections for clarity in response to those comments that came from the public. Um, you know, drafts were available online and hard copies were also available at public locations, including, um, you know, the city hall. And so I just wanted to also point out that um, critically, the Santa Rosa Plain Board of Directors will hold the public hearing on December 9th to consider adoption of this final groundwater sustainability plan. And then, um, you know, staff will go uh, back to the Board of Public Utilities this month and also return on November 30th uh, with a much shorter presentation seeking uh, direction to the city's uh, board member, uh, you know, Council Member Schwedhelm, uh, in terms of uh, direction on whether or not to uh, support the adoption of this plan. Um, but uh, by law, the plan must be adopted and submitted to the California Department of Water Resources by January 31st of 2022. So that deadline is coming up very soon. So um, I guess we can go to the last slide. So uh, I think today, you know, definitely um, my goal was to make sure the council felt comfortable with the plan. It, it is uh, very meaty um, and, and some of the topics that are going to be covered uh, so that we can, um, you know, I can get, gather input from the city council and answer any questions that may come up um, and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, be able to take any of that input back to the GSA too if necessary. All right, thank you so much, Deputy Director. Uh, before I go to additional questions, uh, Council Member Schwedhelm, uh, first of all, thank you for your service on the committee uh, and for being the chair. Is there anything that you wanted to add or any context for Council? Just set the context a little bit and thank Peter and the staff. You know, Jennifer Burke, Director Burke, and her staff has just been fabulous supporting not only uh, me and Council Member Sawyer, but also on the WAC, uh, Vice Mayor Rogers, because it's a subject matter expert. Right, and this groundwater sustainability plan is very technical. So when I heard, oh, there's gonna be an executive summary, that's great, it's a 27 page executive summary because this is very technical information and it's, we have fabulous staff and Sonoma Water has done a fabulous job there. But we really have been, you know, we've had a lot of community meetings, public meetings for all this input. I would encourage everyone to read that 27 page executive summary just to give that feedback. But it's a fabulous job here and some people at some community meetings I've heard, you know, some people are of the belief if I've got a well, I own the water below me. That's not kind of how the way this thing works. It's a shared resource that we all need to care for this. And that's what the whole idea of Iron Sigma is. Whatever we pull out, we need to make sure we replace it so generations to come have the sustainable water source. And that's the whole intent behind this. And also once we do approve this, and it's real important, it's not the Santa Rosa City Council approving this plan, it's Department of Water Resources in Sacramento. Now, as Peter mentioned, in 2020, the urgent or the high need areas had to submit their plans. And Peter, how many, have they gotten their feedback yet from DWR? Because I also want to set the expectation. We submitted in January of 22. We may not hear for months. Peter, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Councilman Schwedt. Um, at this point, you know, two years later, uh, four of those plans, uh, the reviews have been released um, to those basins. I believe there remains about 16 uh, other uh, critically overdrafted basins um, that have not uh, received their formal uh, review and output, but uh, those are forthcoming very soon. But it is, they have about two years uh, 
by law to review these plans. Um, and they're taking every bit of it for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, just because the plan is in review, um, it's important to note that the work doesn't stop with the GSA. Uh, there are requirements to continue to uh, develop these kind of uh, quarterly and annual reports by the GSA and continue to make progress on certain planning elements of the plan uh, absent that review as well. Again, as Peter said, this, once we're done with this, it's not, a, it's, there will be different iterations as we get feedback because some of the technology that's being applied for some of these measurements, and we're very fortunate out of those six, six metrics, seawater intrusion is not something we're worried about in this basin, but some of the technologies, I know there's uh, going to be a helicopter flying around Sonoma County measuring some things with a device from the bottom of it. It's all about this. This is new technology we're trying to apply so that we have the sustainable groundwater source. So I just want to thank, you know, Peter and the entire staff for this. It, it's scary when you think back to, you know, 2016, 2017, when this started. Now here's this product. And it is very dense technical data, but let me just assure you, we have the subject matter expert from Santa Rosa Water and Sonoma Water have done a yeoman's job to get this product here with a lot of community feedback. And our advisory committee too, they are also very um, engaged and provide a lot of feedback that has resulted in the product that's now available. Thanks. Thank you so much. Council, any other questions? All right, let's go to public comment on this item then. If you are interested in providing public comment, uh, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom or line up at the microphone. And we'll take comments. Mr. DeWitt, do you want to kick us off? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I'm a renter that's on a residential domestic well. And the well owner has been frightened by this whole process. He's not on the internet. And I come in to use the library to check the internet. You folks seem to think that everybody's geared into this process when you use the word public. But essentially, it's just been a narrow group of folks that you term stakeholders who've been able to actually participate in these groundwater sustainability management plan meetings. I've gone to some of them, and they're rather exclusive. They're not really about making sure that the residential well owners, the domestic people, are in the decision-making process, if you will. You've said there's 7,000 wells in the county, and what you haven't stated today is how you're going to monitor the residential domestic well water use. You've stated you're going to have about a $10 a year de minimis fee on all of the wells. And that might not seem like a lot to you, but to somebody who believes and has believed since they owned their property that the water beneath them is a mineral right and you have no um, definition here that says to them, well, you're losing your legal rights. What you're basically saying is it's a shared resource and everybody's going to work together to make it good for the future. One of the things that concerns a lot of people is they see wineries and other water users within our community using a lot of water. And they don't necessarily see how that's going to be monitored and done in a balanced manner with a residential domestic well user. The person that I get the water from at the well is very conservative, and so am I, in the sense of we don't waste water. We're very careful with this resource. But we see how many industries and commercial landowners are not so, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, concerned. I see it when I go by a landscaping with a broken sprinkler and the water just pouring out onto the street and no one taking care of it. We see it in many different ways. We hope that you folks, as you go forward, will stand up for the rights of the residential domestic well owners and make sure that they're not monitored in a sense where everybody has to have a new water meter put in. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll go on to the next. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is David Gavridge. Um, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak on this plan. Um, I have a 45-acre property in Bennett Valley uh, that on, relies on the private well. So this um, has been an interesting process to watch. I'm a former EPA, federal EPA um, staffer. Uh, and I think the plan that has come out is absolutely spot on in terms of what it has identified as alternatives for alternatives to strict mandates. Um, and uh, one of my questions is, uh, a pro when the, at first reading the plan, I thought we've got to have uh, better alternatives in terms of uh, the water rushing out the Russian River during these heavy rain times. And the plan actually speaks very directly to that. Uh, one of my questions is, how good is our data in terms of what the capacity is in the underground uh, aquifers to know how much room there is to store water during these heavy rain events? Um, I didn't see a lot of detail in that. I know I've heard about the helicopters flying around with measuring uh, instruments and wonder, uh, are those doing that for measuring um, the capacity uh, in the underground aquifer? But I was bracing myself for some, you know, heavy regulations as a uh, private well owner um, in Bennett Valley and also uh, in um, Windsor, unincorporated Windsor. And um, I really appreciate the um, uh, well thought out nature of this plan. And I hope that it stays on point and that m monitoring is the key. Um, and. Uh, if possible, I'd like a response in terms of how, where are we at with regard to the accuracy of measuring capacity um, underground. So I uh, very appreciate um, the council holding this session. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Joe Messina. I'm a well owner and I'm kind of concerned. I have a couple questions that um, the city and the county are asking us to, to conserve, conserve, conserve. There's a drought, I'll agree, but when will the city and the county lead as examples instead of mandating and putting all these laws on us? When will they take care of their problems such as two aqueducts. One has been leaking for over five years and the water agency has not fixed it yet. And I'm sure you all know about it. It's, I know where it's at. The other aqueduct has been leaking and you, the people are not taking care of it. You hired an outside contractor to come and take care of these leaks. He threw his hands up in the air and walked away. They're not getting fixed. I think the city and the county need to lead by example. Stop the building and letting the water go out into the ocean. Learn how to conserve that instead of coming after us little guys who have well. You have big industries out here that are wasting water. I'm at the bottom of the wine industry. You want to talk about waste? I've been in the cellars and I've been down there. People leave hoses on and it's, it's a waste. So, hey, I commend you in looking at this problem that we're going to have, uh, water, but you guys need to lead by example. Thank you. The last comment I see in the chamber, if there's anybody on Zoom who would like to speak, now would be the time to raise your hand. And seeing none, uh, do we have any voicemail public comments? Looks, looks like no. no. So I'll bring it back to council for uh, additional comments. Uh, Peter, there was a question in there about the accuracy of the capacity underground. Could you speak to that, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's a fantastic question from the member of the public. Um, you know, the, those things have been 
sort of modeled and there are data sets that perhaps go back decades that sort of look at um, you know, you know, the makeup of the basin um, and, and the, that includes, you know, the different uh, types of, um, you know, geologic formations and things like that. Um, they, they are an estimate, you know, in terms of the total capacity and, and the Department of Water Resources does maintain a data set uh, in their published bulletin 118 and that sort of does have an estimate of the total capacity of the basin, but it is a bit you know, fungible. And as the council member Schwedhelm uh, mentioned, um, there are these airborne electromagnetic surveys, AEM. Um, it's a helicopter that sort of uh, goes around with this dangling contraption um, that sort of will allow them to, um, you know, really it uses magnetic um, measurements. I don't fully pretend to understand how it all works, but, um, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, definitely gain a better understanding of the underlying structures that are in that basin and really will help um, create a statewide data set that will improve that long term. And these are the types of things that, that need to continue to occur um, you know, long term so we can better understand you know, things where like where we can perhaps put um, you know aquifer storage and recovery projects in place or stormwater recharge projects, uh, you know, on agricultural lands, um, you know, understanding these underlying structures uh, geologically uh, is important. So, you know, I mean, historically it was, you know, using well logs and, you know, perhaps going out and doing some, uh, some drilling and things like that to determine the underlying makeup of the groundwater basin. Now they can just fly over and gather huge swaths of data uh, through this as well. So, um, you know, the technology is improving. Appreciate that. Uh, I have no other questions or even really substantive converse, comments other than just a, a huge thank you uh, to the entire team that's been working on this. Thank you to Council Member Swedhelm and the entire board. Uh, I do remember when the uh, when Sigma was passed uh, a number of years ago, it, it did fill people with a lot of uncertainty about what the process would look like. It was uh, a terrifying prospect for many folks. And at the same time, it was regarded that it was absolutely going to be needed, uh, particularly given what we expect to happen around climate change. And we obviously have been seeing that play out over the last couple of years. So thank you to everybody who has taken the time to build this plan the right way, to engage with the community, to hear those concerns, and to uh, really come up with, with what I think is a thoughtful plan. Uh, Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to help. Oh, help. I want to thank. Uh, Councilmember Schwedhelm, uh, it was gracious of him to even mention my name. He has not, I believe he has missed one meeting, um, and I'm very thankful for that because I would have been like a fish out of water, um, pun intended. Uh, it's uh, when he first started on this, um, much of it is a, is a mystery, and now I consider him a subject matter expert on, uh, on GSA. and. Although I'm fascinated by aquifer storage, I won't ask any questions about that. I'll, I'll do that offline. Um, I'm very curious how it works and how the measurements are done, both the the um, the size of the storage, how it's how it is mapped, the quality of the water, uh, et cetera. It just it really does fascinate me, and um, so I'm a bit. Um, envious that he gets the he's on the ground floor when it comes to learning about how we will deal with water in the future. So thank you, Tom, for your diligence and your uh, your ability to, to go to each one of those meetings. You um, saved my skin. Um, and thanks to the entire team in the Santa Rosa Water for their expertise in developing and helping to develop this plan. Although there and of course, it's not popular with everyone but necessary for us all. So um, thank you for that. And um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, John. Is there any other feedback for the deputy director? Okay, so we look forward to seeing this. Uh, will we give formal direction to the council member on, I believe it's November 30th. All right, thank you. And with that, uh, Council, we have the rest of our meeting starts at 4 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and recess, and we will come back in about 25 minutes.
Let's go ahead and bring us back. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, thank you, Mayor. As I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, Council Member Tibbetts will be absent at today's meeting. So I'll start with Council Member Schwedhelm. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Council Member Fleming. Here. Council Member Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor Rogers. Present. Mayor Rogers. Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Council Member Tibbetts. All right, Madam City Attorney, could you please report out on closed session? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, council met in closed session on item 2.1, a meeting with labor negotiators. Um, and the uh, council gave direction to the negotiation team and took no final action. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We have no proclamations today, so let's move on to our staff briefings. Mayor Rogers and members of the council, our first staff briefing is our COVID-19 response update. And we have uh, to share with the council and members of the public today some COVID-19 guidance for holiday travel. People planning to travel and attend gatherings over the upcoming holidays should take steps now to protect themselves from COVID-19 and ensure that they have proper documents required to prove their vaccination or testing status. The CDC guidance states that people who are not vaccinated should avoid travel and holiday gatherings. However, there is still time to get vaccinated before the holidays. Unvaccinated people who want to gather for Thanksgiving should get vaccinated immediately as it takes two weeks to become fully protected against COVID-19 after receiving the single dose J&J Janssen vaccine or a second dose of the two-shot Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. For information about vaccine clinics and how to make appointments through the county's vaccine clinic webpage, visit sonomacountyemergency.org forward slash vaccine or visit myturn.ca.gov. Last week, Children aged 5 to 11 became eligible for the Pfizer pediatric vaccine, providing families with another tool to protect loved ones over the holidays. Doses for young children are now available in Sonoma County. To find a dose, parents are encouraged to reach out to their pediatrician or local pharmacy. Starting today, vaccination clinics are available for families and students at nine schools serving populations without convenient or affordable access to health care. For locations of clinics in Sonoma County, please visit the Sonoma County Office of Education website at scoe.org. As of Sunday, November 11th, the county has 1,317 active COVID-19 cases and a total of 408 deaths since the start of the pandemic. That concludes my uh, COVID-19 response update. The next uh, staff update that we have to share with you today is our community empowerment plan. And that will be presented by Magali Tellis, our deputy director of community engagement. Mayor, uh, thank you. Excuse, uh, excuse me, enough. Mayor, may I make an announcement really quick? And we are having some technical difficulties with our closed captioning. Apparently the captioners have connected to the uh, different encoder. So the captions appearing on our meeting are for a different meeting that is happening. So our IT department is working with Granicus to find that what's going on. But I just wanna let anybody from the public who may be watching um, the captioning is um, not for this council meeting. It is for another one. Do we need to take a five minute break to have it sorted out? Um, no, I don't think so because this is something that the IT um, uh, is checking in with Granicus and so I don't know how long that's gonna take. They're working on it right now, but um, they're hoping they, to get it fixed. But in case anybody from the public who's on and realizes that the information being shown online and in the captioning doesn't match what's happening in the meeting, that is why. Okay, thank you. May I, may I Mr. Mayor? Um, and um, Ms. Williams, will the closed captioning ultimately be, uh, be up for the 
for this portion of the meeting, or will this simply be lost for closed mm -hmm. captioning? I'm waiting for an answer on that. Okay, great. Yes, Thanks, I you. posed that question, and Thank I'm you. waiting for that answer. All right, Magali, if you want to take it away. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Rogers, members of the council. Uh, Magali Tellez, uh, Director of Community Engagement here with a quick report on the Community Empowerment Plan. Um, I should say update, sorry. Uh, so in terms of our community engagement efforts around the sideshows, our team collected 608 survey responses from community members providing input on the issue of sideshows in Santa Rosa. We've also held uh, one in-person and one virtual listening session to gather additional information from our Spanish-speaking uh, community and representatives from City Council, Police, Transportation, and Public Works, as well as Community Engagement Office participated in these listening sessions. Our team will be holding a final virtual listening session in Spanish next week on Monday the 15th at 6.30 p.m. Um, we can provide definitely the link um, for folks that want to join us um, or if they can check in with uh, one of our community engagement folks. Uh, happy to supply that. And our team will be working on analyzing the, the data and determining next steps on how to report out the findings to both council and the community. Um, the, we're regarding the Mary Lou Lowrider patrol car, the pinstriping um, paint has been purchased. Pinstriping and mural making have been delayed uh, due to the weather. The rims and tires were delivered, which is really great. We were concerned about um, a shipping issue and we're working on a identifying a shop that can install them for us. The Sonoma County Lower Council is working on designing a car club plaque for the car, which is really great. Um, the, ster the stereo system has been ordered and generously donated by Enterprise Rent-A-Car. The reveal date has been postponed, uh, accommodating for shipping delays that we are experiencing with some of the other items. And per the Sonoma County Lowrider Council's request to align with the celebration of Cesar Chavez Day. Um, so we're going to be pushing our event to March 26, 2022. It will take place on campus. And um, the staff will continue to meet with the Lowrider Council to complete the build and the reveal plan. Um, also, the Lowrider Committee would like to um, extend an invitation to the different departments um, here so that, you know, different departments could um, table and provide information. We'll also be extending uh, that invitation to our local school um, systems, so Santa Rosa City Schools and our Roseland Unified School District to, to come table and sort of provide as many resources and a celebration as possible for that day. Uh, for the Multicultural Roots Project, November is National Native American Heritage Month, and we're featuring stories from our local indigenous communities this month in the Multicultural Roots Projects Project, um, so please check that out. We encourage our community members to learn more about the rich history of our local tribes and tribal leaders. And lastly, the resolution to declare racism as a public health and human rights crisis will be coming to council next Tuesday, November 16th, and we're looking forward to presenting that um, for all of you. That is the end of our report. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, our third uh, staff briefing of the day is um, on the Bennett Valley Golf Course, and Jason Nutt, our assistant city manager, will be providing that update. One moment, he is being promoted to the panelist side. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council members, Jason, that Assistant City Manager, uh, wanting to provide you with a quick update on the Bennett Valley Golf Course Project. Um, we, uh, in early October, uh, pulled together the Bennett Valley Review and Selection Committee uh, to review three proposals that were received from our solicitation for an operations evaluation. Uh, the review and selection committee consisted of Council Member Schwethelm, Chris Nell, who was a member of the public that was appointed by the Bennett Valley Golf Course Ad Hoc Committee, Jen Santos of our Parks Planning Team, Don Hicks of our Recreation Division, James Castro of our Parks Maintenance Division, Jill Scott with Real Estate, and Terry Blatto of our Parks uh, Planning Team. Uh, as they reviewed those three proposals, uh, there was a unanimous decision to recommend the National Golf Federation based on their experience with similar scopes of work in other municipalities. 
Uh, in an effort to expedite this process, uh, I moved forward and, exped uh, and approved the contract. Um, I recognize that uh, during prior conversations, I had agreed to bring this back to the council for uh, authorization. Um, given our timeline and the fact that we were recently informed that we would not be able to get an extension on the uh, current operator's timeline, uh, we felt it was in our best interest to try to gain as many weeks as we could to complete this study, which would allow us time to put a new operator agreement on the street as early as possible in 2022. With that said, um, I went ahead and approved this contract. Uh, it had a total amount of $44,000, which was significantly lower than we had anticipated. Uh, and um, we will be bringing forward a, an item in early December uh, on consent to uh, allow council to authorize the use of the Gulf Enterprise funds to cover the cost for this. In the meantime, the, pro the uh, National Gulf Foundation is currently underway. Uh, we did our kickoff meeting with them yesterday morning, had a great meeting between staff and their consultant team. Um, their top line from their website reads this. It says the National Golf Foundation exists to foster the growth and vitality of the game and business and the business of golf. That's exactly what we're attempting to do with this process. And so using that top line is really uh, a great idea. And let me just read you a very quick statement from them uh, as they put in their proposal says the National Golf Foundation is the recognized industry leader in municipal golf course consulting and has served an extensive client list of public sector agencies, including many in Northern California in recent years. Because National Golf Foundation does not manage, operate, design, finance, or maintain golf facilities, we're able to provide the utmost objectivity in our evaluations. We are also uniquely qualified to assist the city due to our dedicated research division that has been at the forefront of industry participation, research, and trends for decades including extensive recent work relating to the demand effects of COVID-19. Finally, National Golf Federation's recent survey research of municipal golf courses in the U.S. allows us to benchmark our municipal golf facility clients against more than a thousand other municipal facilities on, on key metrics. Those statements were really key and critical in that selection committee making the decision to move forward with this, and we're very excited to, to have them underway. Um, that was the nature of the report. I uh, just wanted to make sure I brought this information to the council in open session, as well as give the public an opportunity to uh, understand what direction we're going. Uh, again, my administrative process uh, adjustment was approved by the uh, Bennett Valley Golf Course Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, we did discuss that in late October. They unanimously agreed that I could go that I should go ahead and expedite this. Um, and so with that, uh, that concludes my update and report. Uh, we're excited to see this process move forward and happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, I've got a couple of questions uh, and council will ask questions on all of the uh, staff briefings. Uh, but Jason, my questions are for you. So with this contract being approved, can you give us the updated timeline for completion of the study uh, and having a new operator in place? So we believe based on the consultants timeline they provided us that they would be able to complete their study by the end of December. Um, given the fact that we're providing them an additional three weeks by expediting the agreement approval, uh, our hope is they'll have a draft to us before Christmas, which would give us an opportunity to finalize and have something ready to go for a drafting of a new operator agreement in early January. Um, with that, we believe that while it may be tight, we believe we can have a new operator selected and prepared to take over operations about the time that the current operator, uh, his contract expires at the end of June. So um, it, is a, it is a tight timeline still, uh, with that, we are looking for weeks to add into the schedule where we can. Uh, and that's why we went through this process of expediting. Uh, and what I heard was around the time that the current operator, uh, his contract expires, uh, what is the contingency plan if we get to that point? Uh, is it 
as I've heard concern from community members, is it to shut down the course temporarily or is there a backup plan? So Mayor, obviously we would like to ensure that there's no, that there's no um, closure of operations. Uh, we would like to have an operator in place several weeks before the contract expires so that we can have a smooth and easy transition. And we believe there's time in the schedule to make that happen. Uh, there are a number of unknowns. Uh, we don't know how many operators will be interested in, in bidding on the, the proposal. We don't know what conditions those operators may have in order to take over the existing operations. So that's why right now we're going to think optimistically and say that we're going to have a smooth transition in the event that something occurs. Um, there may be a closure of operations of the course um, during a period of time. Um, we believe that early in, in the new year, we'll understand whether or not our timeline could be in jeopardy. If we believe there is an opportunity to create some level of assistance with city staff in order to keep things operational, we will certainly put those into motion. We just need to understand at this point in time, staff has never operated this golf course, at least not in recent history. And so uh, I can't say that we can step in easily. Um, and therefore, uh, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be direct and upfront in saying that there could be a closure of the course if things fall into place uh, the wrong way. Um, we will continue to maintain the course. Uh, our maintenance staff is prepared to take on that level of operations so that we don't lose any of the asset. Um, and that asset is very valuable to us. And there are specific maintenance criteria that need to be performed on a daily basis. Uh, and it's our intention to ensure that we can continue to make that happen. Um, so Mayor, uh, we will be doing our best to sustain operations without any interruption but I, I want to make sure that um, you and the public know that there are potential scenarios where we will have to suspend play for a period of time while we do a transition. All right, I think if that is going to be the case in the beginning of the year, um, the sooner that you allow us a chance to have a discussion to see what we can do to avoid that, I think the better. Uh, Efforts it is my intention to bring, uh, to be as transparent and clear with council as possible. And I don't expect that there'll be any unforeseen um, surprises. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll be very much on top of it as we move forward. Okay. And then we have had attempts to extend the current operator if we need to. We have made uh, several attempts to work with the existing operator to extend their contract. Um, we received the most recent correspondence that explained that he was uh, that he and his staff were unwilling to extend and that they were intending to simply comply with the current contract terms. Was there a particular sticking point? There were a number of areas that that particular that our operator was concerned about um, being the condition of components of the irrigation system. Uh, and the condition of some of the equipment that his crew was operating at this point in time. Um, we acknowledged that we were willing to work with him on the acquisition of additional equipment and that we would be looking at the components of the irrigation system that we felt we could reasonably enhance, improve, or replace um, within our current scope and budget. Okay, are there any, any other questions from council? Okay, we'll go to public comment on this item. We'll start with Gregory. Thank you, Mayor uh, Rogers. I'm uh, treasurer of the uh, Benna Valley Golf Club, but I'm, I'm asking this question purely as an individual, but I know a lot of people will be interested. I haven't heard anything about whether or not um, the restaurant, Legends, is being included in the process or not. 
uh, just like clarification, are we bidding, are, are, are people going to be bidding on the entire operation or just the golf course operation? Um, enlighten me. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. The only hand that I see, do we have anybody in the chamber who'd like to speak on this? Seeing head shake no. Let's go to our voice bail public comment. Item seven, staff briefings. My name is Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. COVID response, community empowerment plan, and the golf course study. In a sense, they could all be tied in together. One of the concerns that a local resident pointed out to me is what are we saving the golf course from? And I thought to myself, mismanagement, that's been the problem. And having the people who have been mismanaging it try to make it better might not help. It's kind of like how things went with the COVID response. And community empowerment hasn't really occurred yet. So maybe what you could do is have a strong community empowerment throughout all of Santa Rosa's seven districts to talk about how that one golf course is so important to those people there. And those people in that one district want all the rest of the city to help them save the golf course. So this is where you could really do good community empowerment. You could explain to the rest of the city why it's helpful to them to help Bennett Valley. That would be great. Yeah, start those meetings up soon. Looking forward to hearing about it. All the best to you by now. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes public comment on item seven. Thank you, Dina. I'll bring it back. Uh, Jason, there was a question from Gregory about the restaurant. Could you provide some context? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the restaurant is part of the evaluation that's being done right now. Uh, questions that the consultant will be looking at is whether the restaurant operation should be operated independently of the golf course or whether it should be a component of the golf course operation. Um, we anticipate that by the end of their study, they will give us a uh, recommendation on whether there should be one or two operating agreement solicitations um, and we'll, we'll go from there. But, but the restaurant is absolutely part of the uh, evaluation process right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think what I've heard overwhelmingly from the public is do everything that we can to make sure that there's continuity of service that we don't uh, end up having to close down. Uh, for me, as we go through this process, the restaurant, while important, is not vital to the success of the golf course. And so if this needs to be a bifurcated <clears throat> process to make sure that we are able to maintain keeping the golf course open, I want that option on the table as well. Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to reinforce um, Mr. Nett's dedication to keeping the golf course open, if at all possible. He's looking for every option to maintaining the, the, the play um, at the golf course. Part, part of the difficulty uh, in that the city has never operated the golf course is, is the pro shop. And, you know, it's, it, it is a business. And being able to take a, a staff member or, or train staff to operate that particular business and scheduling uh, play and all of the the, the um, nuances of operating a golf course are numerous. And so um, regardless of the challenge, I know that Mr. Nutt and his team is looking at all possibilities in, in not having any interruption um, in play at the golf course. It, it does not guarantee there won't be, but I know that, that he and his team are looking at all options to be able to maintain play at the golf course. They, he, they understand the value um, and the, the importance to um, families uh, and those regular players and, and players from out of our city uh, in maintaining the livelihood uh, and profitability um, and maintenance of the golf course. Maintaining the greens, maintaining the, the, the infrastructure is in, in essence um, easily done by, uh, by the city. We know how to do that. But um, operating a, a pro shop is not generally in the wheelhouse of the city of Santa Rosa and that's where the challenge lies. 
not insurmountable, but um, it is it is where probably the largest challenge lies. And I know that Mr. Nutt will be giving us fair warning when it comes to the, the potential of having to interrupt play uh, while the contracts are um, negotiated. I appreciate that, Council Member. Uh, I heard you offered your expertise as a former business owner. <laughs> I sold magazines, not golf clubs. <laughs> All right, Council, are there any other questions? Any other comments? Great. We'll continue to move on then. Let's go on to our city manager and city attorney reports. I'm going to have the city attorney start tonight. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do not have anything to report this afternoon, so thank you. Well, that was easy then. It was. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, I will happily take the city attorney's time then. I have four short items to update the council on. The first is regarding the Santa Rosa Veterans Memorial here at City Hall. I'm pleased to announce that through the city's volunteer and park program, uh, local resident Ross Liscom and a group of dedicated community members have adopted the Veterans Memorial Monument at City Hall. This team of dedicated volunteers have trimmed trees, installed new drip irrigation, and planted low water use plants throughout the five bedding areas to bring a new and vibrant look to the memorial site. I am grateful to our dedicated and caring community volunteers. And in honor of Veterans Day this Thursday, I encourage everyone to visit the Veterans Memorial Monument located on the southwest corner of, city, of the City Hall campus and to pay tribute to the men and women who served and sacrificed their lives for our country. Um, I'd also like to celebrate uh, the retirement of one of our very long-term uh, transit department members, a city bus operator for the last 36 years, who has uh, served the city for that long period of time with no preventable accidents during his career. Congratulations to Mike Jackson, and please enjoy your retirement. And finally, uh, two items from our police department. Uh, recently, the police department hosted a trunk or treat at the Veterans Memorial Building on October 27th with several other public safety partners, and it was well attended with hundreds of vehicles and families. In fact, if you happen to be driving by the Veterans Memorial at that time, you probably experienced the traffic jam. Uh, also, uh, I think there was an article in today's Press Democrat that reported out about an ongoing project where officers and detectives led a city effort to address a nuisance property. After numerous calls for service and arrest of occupants for narcotics and other crimes, officers collaborated with code enforcement and the city attorney's office to remove the occupants and resolve the ongoing neighborhood complaint. This was a concerted effort which required many hours of investigative and administrative effort from each of the city departments. And congratulations to all those involved, and thank you for that great collaboration and teamwork. That concludes the city manager's updates for today. Great. Do we have any questions for the city manager on his update? Let's go ahead and check public comment. If you're interested in providing comment, hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. I do not see any hands. Do we have any voicemails? We do not, Mayor. Great. We'll go ahead and bring it back. Thank you so much. Move on to item number nine. Do we have any statements of abstention by council members? Council Member Swithelm? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, although I've read the material, viewed most of the um, video from the last council meeting, I will be abstaining from item 12.17 and 12.18 because I was not present during the presentation. Okay. Are there any others? Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I will need to abstain from item 11.2. Um, they are minutes from the August 31st meeting. Um, special meeting and 11.3, which is the meet, the minutes from the regular meeting on that same date as I it was absent. Okay. We'll note those abstentions. Let's move on to mayors and council member reports. 
who wants to start? with council member alvarez thank you mayor i uh, just want to inform the public and and really through our interpreter that the consulate the mexican consulate will be here on saturday september 20th uh to conduct business for our uh mexican nationals and this will be held at 987 airway court in san rosa with catholic charities and it could be reached through uh, mixcel.sre.gov.mx forward slash C-I-T-A-S dot web portal forward slash. And I'm hoping that our community can take advantage of the mobile consulate that will be coming to town and hopefully it will be a, a, a reoccurrence, a recurring event for people to have access opposed to those that don't have transportation to have to travel all the way to San Francisco to conduct their business, to, to renew their, their, their documents and, and, and conduct new business. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, this morning we had, I'm referring to my notes, so you'll pardon me, um, was a, it was a good long meeting and, and very effective. This morning we had a, an economic development subcommittee in which we got an update on the economic development strategic planning process, including the vision and mission and discussed the focus area elements. And I want to thank council members Fleming and Alvarez for attending this morning and of course our economic development staff because uh, there, the, um, uh, the, there's, there are oftentimes, um, our, our plate is full as are many subcommittees and so I really appreciate their, their attendance. I know everyone on the council were sent a briefing on this and on, on the subject matter uh, that we discussed today and I encourage you to, to find that email and review um, the the overview itself. Um, the second main area of conversation was on furthering the equity overlay that was developed for the ARPA funding um, discussions. Uh, the, the idea is to develop an equity lens framework for ongoing use um, bolstered by data uh, where we consider climate justice, economic justice, and social justice alongside our own procedural justice so we can be really thoughtful in affecting change um, moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Sweto. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two things. First, I want to give a water update report. On November 1st, we had a water advisory committee meeting and all of us in Santa Rosa experienced that atmospheric river, so I want to give a little bit of detail about that. <clears throat> so Sonoma Water staff reported Due to the atmospheric river in mid-October, as well as other rainfall events, both reservoirs have gained storage. Lake Mendocino gained approximately 6,000 acre feet of storage and has over 18,000 acre feet in the reservoir. Lake Sonoma gained approximately 15,000 acre feet of storage and has over 120,000 acre feet in the reservoir. Due to the rainfall, the State Water Board removed the requirement for Sonoma Water and its contractors to reduce diversions from the Russian River by 20% compared to 2020 usage, but is still requiring compliance with the Governor's Drought Declaration. We are still in a drought and the reservoirs are still critically low, therefore all of Sonoma Water contractors will continue to implement their respective storage plans, which for Santa Rosa is a requirement for a 20% community-wide reduction. One other item that I won't go into great detail because we think it was a lot of technical details with the groundwater sustainability plan, the Potter Valley Project relicensing. Uh, the Potter Valley Project partners requested and were granted in abeyance through April of 2022 from FERC, which is a federal licensing agency, regarding the relicensing of the Potter Valley Project and I will provide updated information as it becomes available. And lastly, uh, along with a couple other council members, I attended the Merit Awards Sunday at Finley Center. And I just really want to compliment Recreation Parks staff for creating a uh, fun and very appropriate COVID appropriate event. Um, those of us that have experienced in this chamber, it's one of the best days of the year where you have the chamber packed and everyone gets to share this great news. But the way Recreation Park came up with it, it was awesome. Um, and I think all the recipients really appreciated it. And I was very impressed with the youth representation during some of those uh, awards. Thanks. Mr. Mayor. 
I um, just want to take the time to acknowledge um, our veterans and thank them for their service uh, and give a big, huge shout out to my husband, uh, Sergeant Andre T. Rogers, and my daughter, uh, E3 Sledge, um, who is now in the Navy. Very, very proud of them. Um, and also to announce the um, food and fun drive that will be taking place on December 4th at a place to play between 10 and 2 that many of our uh, council members will be attending, which I'm really happy about that. We're partnering with Redwood Empire uh, Food Bank um, to do a drive through um, food drive. So please look out for um, more information to come on our City Connect and also on our Facebook pages. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor. A uh, number of things since it's been a couple of weeks since we've met. I uh, did want to really thank uh, all of our uh, public safety staff who and park and rec staff who participated and planned the Trunk or Treat event. Uh, it was a huge success. When I went by, there were uh, literally thousands of people who were waiting to get into the, the Vets Hall to be able to participate. Uh, wanted to thank the Chamber of Commerce and their partnership uh, with their Halloween event that they did as well. Uh, I had a chance to be a judge for the, the costume con contest. My personal favorite was a little eight or nine month old who was dressed as a s'more, which I thought was a pretty clever uh, costume. Uh, and again, an, another shout out to our team who partnered with our youth and a huge thank you to everyone who participated in our two day Day of the Dead event that was on the square last week. A uh, couple of working items. Uh, did want to give a brief update uh, on our long term financial policy and audit committee. We did begin to talk about uh, the uh, pension stabilization fund. Uh, that we've talked about here from the dais as we talk about our long-term finances. The full council should see that item coming forward sometime soon. Uh, we've had two different meetings on the ACA 7 working group. That's the constitutional amendment that I've mentioned to council before uh, that would allow local ordinances to override uh, statewide, uh, statewide bills related to land use. Uh, ongoing and I'll continue to update council as we have something further. And then finally, yesterday we had our Sonoma County Transportation Authority and Regional Climate Protection Agency meeting. Uh, the Urban Land Institute has released a report after working with many of our folks here in Santa Rosa and across the region on uh, long-term sustainability uh, and in particular uh, looking at our land use practices and how they relate to resiliency and wildfires. There's 40 recommendations in that report. All council members will be getting that report from SCTA staff. And I would really encourage you to read at least the executive summary as it really is based on our experience with wildfires in our, in our community uh, and will be really critical for moving our county forward in terms of resiliency. Let's move on to item 11. Actually, let's go ahead. We'll do public comment on council members reports. If you're interested in providing comment, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. Not seeing any. Oh, we've got Gregory. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, was the Merit Awards taped? And if so, would you please put, put it up on your website so we can all see? And if it wasn't taped, uh, God, what a missed opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Gregory. So we, uh, I can answer that. We actually have split the merit awards into two different weeks. Uh, so the vice mayor, council member Swethelm and I had an opportunity to do the first half this last Sunday, uh, taking photos and looking at information and congratulating the winners on their projects. That will all be released via social media. Uh, I believe following this coming Sunday, when we have the second batch of folks who are coming in and meeting with us, meeting with council members, taking photos and getting their awards. Uh, I know staff has been really cognizant of being COVID safe. Uh, and obviously we had to cancel the awards last year. So this year it's an opportunity for us to take that in, get that, uh, 
good feeling from such a, an incredible event in our community, and then yes, it will all be shared via social media and congratulating the winners on that. Let's move on to item 11. We have five sets of minutes, August 24th, August 31st for both the special and the regular, September 14th and September 28th. Uh, were there any amendments to any of those minutes? Okay, seeing none, we'll see if there's any public comment. And I do not see any. Did we have any voicemail public comments? We do not, Mayor. Great. Then we'll show those minutes adopted as presented without objection and show Council Member Sawyer as ab abstaining from items 11.2 and 11.3. Mr. City Manager, let's go on to the consent calendar. Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council, we have 18 items on the consent calendar this afternoon, so please bear with me as I read the titles. Item 12.1 is a res resolution for the approval of the issuance of a purchase order to Day Management Corporation doing business as Day Wireless Systems for the purchase of 130 Bendix King portable radios and required accessories through BKM slash RELM NASPO value master agreement number 06913 be the state of California participating addendum number 7-16-58-15. Item 12.2, a resolution making required monthly findings and authorizing the continued use of teleconferencing for public meetings of the city council and all city boards, commissions, and committees pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. Item 12.3, a resolution approving a design build contract award for public safety building generator replacement located at 955 and 965 Sonoma Avenue. Item 12.4, a resolution authorizing the purchase order for a, the 2022 Ford Police Interceptor Hybrid SUVs. Item 12.5, also a resolution um, regarding the acceptance and appropriation of grant funds from the State of California Alcoholic Beverage Control and Office of Traffic Safety. Item 12.6, a resolution uh, for the adoption of a memorandum of understanding with Unit 5 police officers represented by the Santa Rosa Police Officers Association effective July 1 of 2021 through June 30th of 2024. Item 12.7, also a resolution for the adoption of a memorandum of understanding for Units 4, Support Services, Unit 6, Professional, and Unit 7, Technical, represented by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Local Union 856, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.8, a resolution for the adoption of a memorandum of understanding for Unit 3, maintenance, represented by the Operating Engineers Local Union Number 3, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.9, a resolution for the adoption of a memorandum of understanding for Unit 13, Mechanics, represented by the Operating Engineers, Local Union Number 3, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 10 point, uh, I'm sorry, 12.10, a resolution uh, for the adoption of a memorandum of understanding for Unit 16, Utility System Operators, represented by Operating Engineers Local Union Number 3, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.11, a resolution for adoption of wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment for Unit 10, Executive Management, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.12, .12, a resolution 
uh, for adoption of wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment for Unit 11, Middle Management, and Unit 12, Confidential, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.13, a resolution for adoption of a memorandum of understanding for Unit 9, Police Safety Management, represented by the Santa Rosa Police Management Association, effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.14, a resolution for adoption of a memorandum of understanding for Unit 18, Miscellaneous Mid-Management, represented by the Santa Rosa Management Association, effective July 1, 2021, through June 30th, 2024. Item 12.15, a resolution uh, regarding a request for summary vacation of three 25-foot by 3-foot unused public utility easements located at 2900 and 2934 McBride Lane and 1142 State Farm Drive. Assessor's parcels numbers 015-492-019, 015-492-017, and 015-492-006, file number VAC 21-003. Item 12.16, a resolution for approval of a master agreement administering agency state agreements for state funded projects. Item 12.17, an ordinance adoption, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code to incorporate zoning code interpretations made by the city's zoning administrator and other te technical corrections, file number ST21-001. And the final item, 12.18, an ordinance adoption, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title IX of the Santa Rosa City Code by amending Chapter 9-12, Refuse and Sanitation, and Chapter 9-14, Construction and Demolition Debris by adding provisions and requirements of Senate Bill 1383, Short-Lived Climate Pollutants, Organic Waste Reductions. That concludes the consent calendar. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Councilor, are there any questions on that very long, long consent calendar? All right, let's see if there's any public comment. We'll start with Gregory. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for indulging me. My name is Gregory Farron. I just would like to have somebody, maybe it's your long-term finance committee report, but it'd be nice to know what the cost of 12.6 through 12.14 is. Uh, I, I suspect it's probably uh, a consent calendar that tops every, uh, every decision you've ever made financially. And I'd just kind of like to know what those uh, MOUs cost us. Thank you. All right, that's the only hand that I see there. Do we have any voicemail public comments? We do. Consent items 12.2, Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. These meetings that you've been holding for over a year and a half of, um, you call them teleconferencing, they could be helpful to the city, but they're not as helpful to the community unless perhaps you explain how the community can maximize their efficiency for a citizen. It would be wonderful if you continue to do this perhaps because then you don't have to have everybody down at the city, people can call in, people can send messages. But one would hope you would allow for the people who do attend the meetings in person to actually be given the courtesy to have their concerns and comments first, and then those folks that are Zooming or calling can have theirs after. That would just seem to be polite. 
although I know often politics isn't polite, it could be nice. On these other resolution items, all of the bargaining units appear to have made agreements now. It looks like they run through till the 30th of June, 2024. And it looks like people will be feeling okay with their financial packages that they wouldn't agree. So I'm hoping now you'll get to the next thing and that's allow the public to participate in some discussions about the hiring of the next city manager. Perhaps allow public members to be at the interviews. Although I've been told you already finished everything and you're just waiting to hire the person that you chose without even really involving the public. If that's the case. That's a sad state of affairs. They call that business as usual. Bah, bah. Hopefully we won't have that. Hopefully you'll get a new city manager that won't tolerate the malfeasance that's gone on in the past in the city. Thank you kindly. Mayor, that concludes public comment on item 12, consent calendar. Great. Mr. City Manager, there was the question about the total cost of the MOUs that were presented today. Um, I don't know if you've got that number or the number that is of the MOUs that have been approved overall, because we did a couple in another day, but I think it's instructive. So just so we're clear with the public, we still have four units that are still involved in negotiations for contracts that have not been resolved yet. So of the ones that were approved tonight, uh, the impact to the general fund on an ongoing basis is about $9.2 million per year. The total cost for all employees, including the enterprise fund employees, uh, is about $12.2 million per year. Great. Thank you so much. Councilor, are there any other questions or comments? All right. I just want to take a moment and thank all of the bargaining units that we do have our MOUs on for today uh, for not just continuing to serve the community, but really serving the community at a difficult time and working with us to make sure that your members get what they need to, to feel valued and also understanding that uh, we're not in the financial condition that we would like to be in to really be able to show that as much as we feel it. So we'll continue to work on that through the long-term finance committee, through all of our different discussions. Uh, and, and really it just can't be stated enough how much we appreciate the hard work that everybody does um, around here. With that, let's go ahead and see if there's a motion. Vice Mayor. I move items 12.1 through 12.16 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Let's call the vote. Okay, I have a note that Council Member Schwedhelm was abstaining from item. Uh, oh. 17 and 18. Okay, not on consent. Uh, oh, 12.17, 12, 12 12.18. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That was Council Member Sawyer seconding. All right, Council Member Schwedhelm. Madam Clerk, I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, before, I, before you go forward, with me um, abstaining from, um, oh, I'm sorry, never mind, I, I, I just disregard, thank you. <laughs> sorry, I confused you. <laughs> no, it's okay, no, not a problem, I confused myself. Okay, so Council Member Schwedhelm. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Tibbetts absent. I would also like to move items 12.17 and 12.18 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Motion by the Vice Mayor and a second from Council Member Sawyer. Let's call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Oh, I'm Ab sorry. Abstain. Thank you. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with five ayes, with Council Member Schwedhelm abstaining and Council Member Tibbetts absent. 
Okay. Well, council, we have to take a two minute break while we wait for the five o'clock hour. When we come back, we will just keep rolling through our agenda and do public comment for non-agenda items and then finish up with our public hearing. We'll be back in just a minute. And we're back. Madam Clerk, can you call the, the roll, please? Thank you. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Here. Councilmember Sawyer? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Councilmember Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor Rogers? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Councilmember Tibbetts. Okay, let's see if we have any comments for our non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for the public to bring up issues that aren't on today's agenda. Uh, we can't get into a back and forth, but it is certainly something that we can get some questions answered or get back to folks outside of the meeting. If you're interested, hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. All right, if you wanna come up to the podium. Hi, uh, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, staff, uh, for your time and your ongoing commitment to Santa Rosa's betterment. It is really appreciated. Uh, last week, the Sacramento Bee ran an editorial entitled, PG&E has destroyed enough California communities. It's time for a public takeover. Two days previous to that, Congress Member Ro Khanna from Silicon Valley had gone on KQED radio to say that PG&E has pushed things beyond the tipping point and we need a public takeover. But Santa Rosa doesn't need to wait for the dismantling of the conglomerate. Santa Rosa's city can invest in public power. So what is public power? Public power utilities are one of the three primary types of electric utilities that serve customers in the United States. 
Public power utilities are not-for-profit, community-owned, and locally controlled. All in all, there are already 52 municipalities in California that provide public power to the residents and businesses, according to publicpower.org, a not-for-profit that tracks these things. One in seven Americans are served by a public power utility. More than 2,000 communities in 49 states and five U.S. territories have public power utility. So, if you live in a public power community, it means that you own your electricity, your electric utility, and, and can participate in running it. It means you benefit from affordable energy, better service, and a utility that cares about the overall well-being and growth of your community. A couple of more statistics. Residential customers of public power utilities pay 11% less than customers of investor-owned utilities. Outside of major adverse events, like storms, customers of a public power utility are likely to be without power for less time, 62 minutes a year compared to 150 minutes a year for customers of private utilities. My friends in Southern California ask me, why do you pay so much for electricity? And the answer is, because we are still beholden to PG&E and we don't have to be. If one of the council members were to champion public power and get Santa Rosa out from under the destructive and usury thumb of PG&E, that council member would be a hero to all Santa Rosans. Thank you for, the t for your time. I really hope that the city council will take public power seriously, as so many other communities in California already have. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing nobody else in the chambers, I see no hands via Zoom. Do we have any voicemails? We do, Mayor. My name is Barbara Phillips, and I'm calling about agenda item number 13. I specifically would like to address lighting along the Santa Rosa Creek Trail. At night, um, there have been a few incidents with a group of bike cyclists that I ride with, and um, not to blame the homeless because they have they need some place to go, but they're out there without lighting of any sort. And we had a run-in just last week where someone had sustained in our group sustained a minor injury. If there had been lighting along the way, we would have seen the obstruction and been able to uh, avoid it. So I'd like to encourage some lighting along there for safety purposes. Thank you. Hi, this is Eris Weaver from the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, and I'm speaking to agenda item number 13. Um, as we are moving into this darker time of the year, um, safety of driving and cycling at night is really important. And I'd like to bring your attention to one particular issue, and that is the lack of lights on our Class 1 bike paths, like the Santa Rosa Creek Path. Um, there have been uh, reports that I've been getting of minor collisions between folks cycling on the path and folks um, sleeping or hanging out there in the dark. Um, and even though the folks riding did have headlights on, they were still not entirely able to um, see the folks who were staying there. So having some light on those paths would make it a lot safer for everyone involved and possibly make them um, more better used through more of the time. Those of us who use the paths for transportation and not just for recreation, sometimes you know, it's dark when you get off work and you need to be able to get home in a safe way. So it's either right on the street um, where you're worried that cars are going to see you or right on a path where you're worried that you're going to smack into somebody because the path isn't lit. So we would really appreciate your attention to that matter. Thank you. Public comment on non-agenda matters, item 13, Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. I wanted to thank you, you hopefully the council, because it appears at Southwest Community Park, some of that open sewage that was there has been moved or uh, some new methods are being placed there to keep people from uh, urinating and defecating in public on the eastern side by the parking lot. That would be a great spot for one of those porta potties that our parks over here are so famous for. 
And the more porta potties, the better, I think, instead of having those people out there in public view where the school kids from Dutton Meadow School can see them taking their dumps and peeing in the bushes. That's sad. That shouldn't be happening. But one has to wonder, are you folks going to perhaps really get into utilizing the facilities the taxpayers have paid for when restrooms are built? I know at the Olive Street Park, that restroom is open, and the one across from City Hall on Santa Rosa Avenue is open, plus that new quarter-million-dollar uh, Portland Zoo, as you call it, has been open. There is a need for a greater oversight at the parks in Santa Rosa. You've gotten some money. You're uh, discussing how you'll spend it your way, what the employees want. How about involve some of the people from Rosa to talk about how a qualified census tract is the most disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened in the entire community could have an opportunity from the ARPA funds, the America Rebuilding Program. That would be wonderful for Rosen. But nobody I know has heard anything about it. But we do know that you have an Office of Community Engagement now. Maybe some of those people can come over here and talk to the longtime residents and taxpayers. I haven't seen I haven't seen that lady that got hired a year and a half ago. Saw her once at City Hall when the NAACP met with then Mayor Tom Schwedhelm. That was outside. Never seen her over here in Rosen. So how about you folks spend some time helping the folks in this disadvantaged area of Rosen, which you hurt when you created a county island 25 years ago and made it worse during all those years. The four years we've been in the city, all we've heard about is, oh, the survivors from the fire. Well, what about the survivors from the racism and the discrimination and the other problems that Santa Rosa politics and city employees forced on the people of Roseland? Here, that concludes public comment on item 13 on agenda matters. Okay, we have no report items tonight. Let's move on to our first public hearing, item 15.1. Mayor Rogers and members of the City Council, item 15.1 is a public hearing. The matter before the Council is the density bonus uh, ordinance and possible amendments. And Andy Gustafson, our senior planner, is going to be presenting the staff report on this item. Thank you very much and uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. I'd like to present a ordinance amendment to the density bonus and other incentives, developer incentives. This ordinance was um, amended last by city council in January of 2019. And tonight uh, we have an amendment that basically will implement some key changes in state law that have occurred over the last year. Next slide, please. So uh, in 20, uh, January 2021, state law was changed to implement a number of uh, changes that have come out of uh, several years of legislative activity in the housing arena. And uh, the state density bonus law has been subject of a number of provision changes that are mandated by the state. Uh, I'll go through those changes individually. Um, but I also want to note that those changes in state law um, also affected our supplemental density bonus program, which is a uh, program that the city instituted to further encourage density bonus uh, incentives here in the city. And then finally, uh, there are some technical changes. So what is a density bonus? A density bonus mm -hmm. is an incentive that the city and other jurisdictions used to help to encourage developers to include affordable housing in residential development. This is an idea that's been around for decades. Um, and basically the idea is that when a developer commits to providing a percentage of the total allowed units that would be permitted according to the zoning or the general plan, if those are committed to affordable housing, we reward or incentivize the uh, developer 
by allowing them to build beyond the number of units that would be ordinarily allowed. Um, this incentive or this bonus also includes waivers from development standards so that developers who do commit to providing low and very low income housing in their projects can also get reductions in setbacks and height and other development standards. Next slide, please. So the main areas of the new state law um, that was changed in January of 2021 was that the, um, the, the threshold or the level of, of uh, affordability that a developer needed to commit in a project was lowered. So it made it easier to qualify for density bonuses, made it more available. Secondly, the maximum amount of density bonus allowed by the state was increased from 35% to 50%. So now a developer can get um, nearly half as much housing on a site than formerly was, was would have been allowed in the, the general planner zoning. And then finally, uh, a new provision was added to reward developers of 100% affordable projects, which allowed them, which now allows them 100% density bonus, nearly doubling the number of units that are allowed on site. And also for the first time, moderate income rental units may be um, included in, in the density bonus um, mix. Uh, this, this helps with project affordability. Next slide. There were several other um, uh, changes by state law, and I'll go through these quickly. Um, part of the feature or, or um, framework of the density bonus law was that it also provided incentives, and as I mentioned, to reduce development standards. Those previously were not um, limited in terms of number that could be claimed. Now they've been limited to four. The city does have the ability to uh, grant more if it so wishes. Secondly, um, the density bonus uh, provides uh, a, a number of remedies or excuse me, parking reductions and such when they're located within a half mile of a major transit facility. Um, that access or that radius had to be unobstructed and the terminology for obstructed was um, clarified in this new law. And then uh, this new update to the density bonus at, by the state eliminated parking for age-restricted rental housing that lie within that half mile radius of a major facility or that is served by paratransit. Next slide. Um, so all these changes in particular, the increase of the density bonus law uh, to allow now 50% bonus uh, impacted our local density bonus program. Recall in January, 2019, um, the council adopted a supplemental density program um, with, with the idea that in specified areas of the downtown, uh, downtown station area plan and also in the North station area plan, uh, we would allow more of a bonus beyond what the state would allow up to 100% or twice what would otherwise be um, allowed by the general plan. This ordinance amendment does not increase the total number. We still keep the cap that a project that uses the supplemental density can achieve. There, um, so we don't change the absolute number of, um, of units that could be built on the site under the density bonus, supplemental density bonus, but we do change the, um, the entry threshold or, or the point at which the supplemental density bonus is triggered. So we can see here at this chart um, that for the 100% or the, the sites that are designated for the maximum supplemental density bonus, um, there would be uh, uh, the the developer would have to first exhaust the state's fifty percent density before they can go into the um, supplemental density bonus and limit it at um, uh, still be limited at one hundred percent. 
I'm happy to talk about this program, how the state's density bonus and the supplemental density bonus work together. But we've just basically made the adjustment to ensure the current maximum density that can be achieved under a supplemental density bonus is, remains the same. Next slide. Um, the Environmental Quality Act does require review of, of a project and an ordinance amendment such as this. And at the time the uh, council adopted the um, uh, environmental document for the amended ordinance in 2019, uh, it was established that the project would not have any significant impact and thus a negative declar declaration was adopted. This um, amendment that's put before we before you this evening does not require subsequent uh, environmental review because in this case, uh, there was no increase in any previously considered impact that might result from the density bonus. And also there was no new environmental uh, circumstance or effect um, that has come into place in the city or the areas affected by the density bonus that um, would change the conclusions of the council's original adoption of the negative declaration of 2019. So next slide. Um, so it is recommended by the planning commission and staff that the council approve this ordinance to amend the city code chapter 2031 density bonus and other developer incentives to be consistent with the state code section 65915 density bonuses and other incentives. I'm available to answer questions. Um, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Do we have any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. If you're interested in providing comment on this item, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on Zoom. And I see none. Madam Deputy City Clerk, no public comments? Correct, there are no uh, advanced public comments. Okay, then we will go ahead and close the public hearing. Bring it back to council. Are there uh, any comments? All right, Council Member Swedholm, this is your item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd move an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa to amend City Zoning Code Chapter 20-31 Density Bonus and Other Developer Incentives to be consistent with State Government Code Section 65915 Density Bonuses and Other Incentives, File Number REZ21-003, and waive further reading the text. Second. Motion from Council Member Swedhelm, second from the Vice Mayor. Go ahead and call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Tibbetts absent. Great, thank you so much, Andy. We appreciate all the good work. Thank you. We'll move on, we have no written communications. Let's see if we have any additional hands for our last public comment period of the night. And I am not seeing anybody raise their hand. We already did voicemails. So we will go ahead and adjourn. Thank you, everybody.